those are two really, really, really important things is a like understanding how lucky you are to be able to do what you're doing. Uh, and two, understanding the importance of the work. Yeah. Right. Like doing the Raptor stuff. Like I was like, man, like I'm shape like personally kind of shaping the narrative of how, how this is going to be documented, yeah. at least from a team standpoint. And right? you'll, like, you, you'll look at that 20, 30 years yeah. from now, you know, maybe other people will look at it. And, and a lot of those images, especially like of the crowds and like of what's going on dressing part, a lot of those images will be in be, history. Books. It's like, that's, but that's like, I did that. And yeah. it's like, it's, it's amazing. I'm so fortunate. And so I, I'm I, like every day I'm like, man, I'm really lucky I get to do this. You love what you do. Absolutely. All right. Welcome everyone to episode number 10. Yes, we're in the double digits now. Number 10 episode of the Sports Creative Showcase. Juan here as always. And for today's double digit milestone episode, we have a very special, I mean, everyone's special, but you know, we have a special guest here today with us today, uh, professional sports photographer, TFC club photographer, Lucas Shishang. I hope mm. I said that right. Yep. Shishang. Shishang yep. sitting down here with us. Now, Lucas is an incredibly talented photographer here out of here in Toronto. You're known primarily for your work for TFC, but your sports photography has become some of the most recognizable in the Toronto sports scene from the 2019 MLS cup final to producing iconic photography in Jurassic park. You're one of the few photographers that I know who have touched a lot of fast in the Toronto sports scene. You've done stuff with the Raptors. He's done work with the Argos. So I wanted to, first of all, welcome you to the podcast. How have you been? What's going on? Well, thanks for having me. Uh, good, man. Just uh, we're getting to the end of the TFC season. Uh, it's been a tough 2023, mm -hmm. but kind of wrapping things down on that front. And we got Leafs, Raptors. Uh, the whole Argo. cycle, the whole cycle it's, begins all over again. It just keeps going. Do you get an off season? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. Okay. Uh, TFC, I have, I'll have like many off seasons within the season. So TFC will have like international breaks and so I'll have like yeah. kind of breaks. You got a few week, a week or two here. A week or two, yeah, that where I can kind of just sort of relax. But I try to stay busy. Nice. Yeah. Nice. You have, wear a lot of hats here. You work yeah. for TFC, you work mm -hmm. with the Leafs, you work, you've done work with the Argos before, you do some work. You're kind of in the MLSE bubble here, right? Yes. How long have you been doing that for? How long have you been kind of in the field of sports photography? Because we would have met, you know, I think I worked with the Argos in like 2021 ish Maybe, yeah like just coming out of covid that's when i would have met you yeah but how long have you been doing this thing before we met you know give me the timeline of your career so far as a photographer so i mean i, I think the whole timeline is is important because i think it all leads leads into itself but i started my first job was with the blue jays in 2017 mm -hmm. and that was or with uh, mlb am so uh that was like doing like uh what was it what's that called the program mike chisholm does it oh the L uh, the lcc uh, yeah Keisha does it yeah yeah so the lcc so before that i think it was called um Oh my God. I can't remember. It was called something. So remote correspondence, something like that. Yeah. Live, live remote correspondence. Something like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. So it was that. So it's, you're, you're, you're on the ground for MLB advanced media, doing social media photos for, you know, live updates for whoever team, whatever team is uh, in Toronto, the Jays themselves sort of supplementing that. Mm -hmm. So that was 2017. I had a part-time role there. Um, and then rolling forward into 2018, I had a friend with uh, TFC who reached out and said, Hey, we really liked the work that you did with, uh, with the Jays. Would you be interested in doing some game day stuff with us? And I said, yeah, of course, I'd love to. That'd be great. And then that kind of, kind of snowballed. The and domino effect. Yeah. And now you're here kind of doing it yeah. as your main, main full-time gig for the set. Pretty for, much, for yeah. kind of every summer, right? Yep. So let's back up a little bit because I actually didn't know you did work with the Blue Jays and you got started that way. But you know, obviously my audience and the people I try to have on this, like, you know, talk towards to, to the audience of this podcast is people who are just beginning, mm -hmm. figuring out how to get there. How, where did you kind of get your start with photography? When did you pick up a camera and how did you take it, take it from like, you know, everyone does it. You take it from like being a hobby, taking mm -hmm. photos, taking videos here and there, making content for yourself to then, you know, finding a role in the Jays. Like how, what was that process from like your first camera to kind of getting hired there? I think there's two important sort of factors leading to where we got to. One was graphic design background mm -hmm. and two was a sports background. So throughout high school, I was just like a Photoshop geek, like constantly. That yeah. was that was just like I would do that for fun. I would like skip class and like just be on Photoshop, just like making sports graphics, wallpapers, signatures for forums, that kind of stuff. If you're part of like the sports graphics community, you know, 10, 15 years ago, that was like a big deal. Yeah. Um, and so that's sort of where I like honed my skills. And then I went to Humber College to try to make a career out of graphic design. So I was in advertising graphic design. At the same time over, I was playing baseball, played on the varsity team, uh, and I was okay. And I had opportunities potentially to play in the States. And so I was really focused on baseball. Yeah. School kind of... Took a backseat. Took a, yeah. Took a backseat. Seize, get degrees kind of vibe. Yeah. yeah. And then... Uh, 
then I got kicked out of Humber because my grades weren't good enough, and nah, then so okay. I had to reset. Um, so baseball sort of just kind of took a backseat. Took a backseat. So okay, now I, I you know I have to focus on school. Um, graphic design school wasn't really for me, so I kind of just floated a little bit, did some freelance stuff, tried nice. to figure out what I wanted to do. And then uh, I guess at the ripe old age of 21, 22, I applied to OCAD for photography. And at that point, it was probably like six, seven years of just like hobbyist photography with like a little little DSLR. Yeah. And then like a five hundred dollar thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, uh, you know, I, I like playing with it, but it wasn't really like, a, you know, wasn't a main thing for me. And then I just sort of realized, OK, like I have the skill set in Photoshop. I kind of know what I'm doing uh, to a certain point. Yeah. I'm OK with the camera, but I'd like to learn how to do that. And I feel like I can I can you know, make a career out of this. Yeah. I think, I think anyone who's worked in graphic design, especially maybe not in a sports environment where it's like very quick turnaround, but if you're working graphic design in like a more, I'll say like, uh, the corporate cogs yeah. kind of like when you're doing like two weeks of work on like one project and it's revision after revision after revision, and you're dealing with a client that's like pretty picky, it's, you start to get really frustrated with like the lack of, of immediacy with yeah. the project. So I think that you know, the idea that like I can take a photo with a digital camera and I can turn it around and be like, do you like this? Yes or no. Yeah. Right. And that's like the revision process oftentimes. A hundred percent. And like that, that to me, like I was just like, this is, this is what I need. I need that sort of immediacy. So that is one of the main things that drew me into, into photography. So started, uh, started studying creative photography at OCAD 2014 and then 2017, Friend of mine, uh, Adam Kruger. Cruz. Yeah, works with the Jets now. Uh, he was interning, I think, or I don't know if he was interning at that point, but he was just starting out his career, did sports media or sports management, SPEMA at... Um, Brock. Brock, that's right. Uh, and he was he had a had an in at MLSE, and I guess a job came across his desk. And he was not with the, with, with MLB, but he's like, hey, you should apply for this. Like, you played baseball, you have a good... Sp- uh, photography. Good photography yeah. at this point. It was like two and a half years of school plus whatever else. All the graphic stuff that I did. So I was like, I can present this whole package to MLB and be like, hey, like this is what I do. You want to hire me? Yeah. yeah. And so they were like, well, you don't have any sports photos in your in your portfolio, but like the other stuff is decent and you obviously have a sports background. You can talk baseball. You know what you're doing. Like, let's take a part time chance on you. And I'm just so super grateful for it. Cause that opportunity was the kickstarted everything. That's, that's the door opening. And the crazy thing is in retrospect, like I remember when I applied for that and like it was getting down to like interview time and there's like a second interview. It's like first interviewing with the people from the league, then a second interview with the people from the league, then an interview with the people from the blue Jays. And it was like, wow, like I think this is, might actually happen. Right. Yeah. And then they're like, Hey, like, sorry, we didn't pick you for the full-time role. Like, I was devastated. Like I was so upset. Especially because like it, it all builds up and like, especially when you go through multiple rounds of interviews, yeah. you're kind of like, Oh my God, like I might actually like, you know, this is going really well, but you, I think we all, always forget that there's other people in the running for this. So yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. And, and, and like just that sort of like that feeling of like, man, I came this, this far was so close. Like, I feel like all the hard work is like paying off and like, and then it was just like, yeah, sorry, no, we picked somebody else for the full-time role. And I was like, well, what a bummer that, that really stinks. Um, and then they were like, yeah, but we'd like to bring you on in like a part-time role or like a backup role, like a reserve. So if like, yeah. if one of the main, I think there was two uh, other people ahead of me, if one or one or two of those couldn't make it or for like bigger games, like opening day, Canada day, uh, they brought me on board to like supplement and that, that small opportunity was the thing that like blew the door open, mm-hmm. which is just, I mean, yeah, so looking funny. back on it, you wouldn't think that that's such a big thing, but like even just like getting your foot in the door. Yeah. yeah. It sucks. You didn't get the full time thing, but I think that shows that like, and I, I just talked to someone who I was kind of helping out with an interview and it was the same thing. I was like, even if you don't get the job, like you never know what doors or people you can meet through this who might be like, we couldn't have you for this, but we can do like, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. like literally just give, even if you don't get a job through a, an interview, like it's just yeah. network building. hundred like, percent. It's, it's getting to know people and you never know when things come up. People oh. talk about you in a room and you don't know that's happening. That's yeah, that's exactly right. Like the perspective I have on like interviewing and even like emailing people, like the moment somebody sends you an email back, like that's, that's already an opportunity. Your foot's already kind of creeping into yeah. the door, right? Like, so you know, if you're at the interview stage, even if you don't get the role, like you're on somebody's radar, yeah. right? And like you can say, look, like people you know, get jobs, people move away, sh- yeah, shit happens, and yeah. you know now, like you know, the it's like sport, it's kind of like sports, oddly enough, where like you yeah. can be a bench or a role player, like in the system, yes. someone gets injured and you just get the call up, and that's kind of how it is, you know. Yeah. It's even like that in the creative industry for sure. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I think honestly, having a background of like playing competitive sports, it's like that's. Mm-hmm. That lends itself to to a landscape like the, the creative industry, where it is it is competitive. 
Uh, but it's also like a really collaborative and like team team based environment, right? And like having the know how of like okay, like know when to compete, know how to compete with yourself, know how to make yourself better and those around you better, but also don't bring people down. I think that's like the whole all of it. It's like there's so many parallels, and yeah. it's so useful to like. It's very easy. From. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's and I think that's why as creators we kind of like really understand what people like the subjects we go to, the athletes go through, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of we kind of get it in the yeah. weird sense. Yeah, it's nice. You have this sort of like innate understanding. Yeah. Or like maybe not innate, but it's this built in. Yeah, you get you understand the situation that they're in for sure. Yeah. So moving forward, you do you do the um for lack of a better thing, it's just called L C C you do that yes. role part time for a few years and you get in your foot in the door through MLSE. Mm-hmm. Let's just fast forward here a little bit. You know, you've been with the team since twenty nineteen. Mm-hmm. Um 18. Wh- eight, 2018. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, what is the experience like, you know, working with a singular team to that degree? Because I feel like, you know, a lot of people, their dream is to be the team photographer mm. or the team videographer, or whatever, like being the person following the team. Give me like, you know, just what, what is it like to experience that as a sports fan growing up and being able to like now see a team through the highs and lows? What's that experience like as a whole as you know, that you get to see, you know, since 2018? It's it's great. Like I, I consider myself pretty lucky because the way that my role works, I'm not always there every day, which is nice because when things aren't going well, I'm not required to be there, which from a, from like a maybe dramatic, like dramatic standpoint or like, when, you know, when things aren't going great, it's it sometimes can be a negative environment to be around. Of right? course. Like, yeah. People, you no one likes to be on a team that's losing. No. And, and it's just, everybody's on edge and from, from like the social media team to the players, to the coaching staff, to the equipment staff, to the sports staff, like everybody's just kind of on edge, right? There is in sports, like the, the, the adage is winning fixes everything. And it does, it really does, right? It helps gloss over like any sort of small kind of even like personality issues, right? Like, you know, if you're having internal conflict between, you know, or somebody like, for example, like on social media, like if somebody tweets something that doesn't go quite right, if you're winning, it's okay, you can let it go. If if, if you're losing and, it, and you, you tweet something that might not be totally right, it can rub a player the wrong way and it's, you know, it can be awkward conversation. So for me, I've, I've been all that like an arm's length pretty much the whole time, which is nice because I'm there for for game days, for major moments, for um, you know major press conferences, signings, that sort of thing. So it's kind of like I'm there for like milestones. Yeah. So I, I can see sort of what the milestones are like, and then also you know being now with with uh, in a role where I'm like traveling with the team, um, seeing sort of those the smaller like those smaller moments in between. Yeah. Um, so it's to me, it's just it's a lot. It's very similar to just like, you know, if you've played sports at, at any given point in time or like you've been in a in a class with like your cohort of, of classmates, it's it's similar. Right. Yeah, it's it's people are friendly to one another. There's there's, you know, sometimes there's good days. There's bad there's days. Good days. There's bad days. Yeah. There's there's conflict. Uh, you know, there's. <laughs> There's, there's people, you know, that disagree with certain things. Right. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, you're all working towards the same thing. And I think, I think especially TFC, the way that they're structured, even, even having, having a, like a training ground, as opposed to like, if you're working with like the Leafs or like NHL, you're in like a centralized office. They're, they're all, they're in their own thing. Like they have their training ground. So it's like, it's, it's, it's nice. It's like a very, you know, so many companies and teams, oh, we're like a family. It really does have that sort of like family. Yeah. Everybody top to bottom from, from like, you know, just like, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to like rank it because it doesn't feel but like everyone there's is like a cringy. hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just like, it's just, everybody knows everybody. everyone's working towards the same thing and yeah. everyone under, and it kind of gets that. Yeah. yeah. And like everyone's on a first name basis. Yeah. Like it's, and it's just, it doesn't matter. You can have an open conversation. Like social media can have a conversation with the team president. Like one of the players can have a conversation. And I think that's them. easier too when the club is like, not to say the MLS is like, obviously it's a smaller league compared to the other yeah. professional leagues in North America. But like, you know, you have that ability to have that line, line of communication with people you wouldn't normally have it's not like you know with the Leafs you can't just go talk to like Shanahan whenever you want yeah right it's like there's a more open air like kind of you know environment I yeah. think that everyone kind of it's a, a little bit more tight-knit I would say right absolutely and, yeah. and in, in that same sense it's like it's a lot more collaborative so it, you're you can get a lot of things done and and you know if you have a question like for, you know working in social media working on the sort of marketing side if you have an idea about something you can take it directly to to team to staff whoever, yeah, to whoever and be like yeah. can we do this yes or no like it's not like i know i know on the leaf side of things i do a little bit of work with them I, i'm not really privy to how everything goes all the time but like 
there are certain things that definitely have to have approval from the higher ups and mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a longer process. Let's go back to 2018, your first year with TFC. Mm-hmm. Uh, you go from shooting baseball with the Blue Jays yep. to shooting soccer, obviously two very different sports in the way they're played, the speed they're played definitely. and the kind, of, the kind of photography you have to capture. What was it like that first year transitioning between those two sports? Because like I said, they're obviously very different and you know, coming from me, like I've gone from shooting hockey to shooting football and they're very different sports. So you have to shoot them differently from a video perspective. So from a photo perspective, what was that transition like? And what was your experience like in your first year shooting that team? It was it was interesting because, yeah, they had just won MLS Cup in 2017. So there's a lot of hype around it. And, and the energy was just like something I'd never really experienced before. That was the club's first title. First title. Yeah. And uh, in 2018, I started uh, in like February because we were playing CONCACAF matches. And that year we made it to the CONCACAF finals uh, and losing in penalties, uh, which was that was painful. It's mm-hmm. painful because would have been in Club World Cup had we won, which is which is just amazing, right? Like yeah. that's that's really like the, the the pinnacle of what you can achieve as a as a club team. of a club team. Uh, but that energy was was just like unmatched. Like BMO Field in February, it's like minus fifteen with the wind, snowy chill. sometimes, snowy, and it's like at that time, like we had a, they had expanded it to like almost forty. I think it was like thirty seven thousand seats to to accommodate for MLS Cup final, and like they still had the expansion open, and it was like. It was packed every game, it, and it was freezing and just this this just immense wall of noise. Versus being in the, the you know in the sky dome in the summer, the roofs open, yeah. nice weather, you know, yeah. But you know, you know, there's kind of like there's like that that like I don't know how to explain it, but if you've been to if you've ever been to the sky dome, it's like Rogers Center, I guess, for branding purposes. If you've been, it's like there's this this like quiet like drone it's just mm-hmm. like a like a white noise kind of like, like a like, hum a hum yeah you know and you know exactly what it is that's just that sound right like if you watch it on tv you can always hear it like you know if there's like a gap in between commentary. in between the, the commentary like just before the pitch i could it's just like it just kind of always sounds like that. at bimo field it's not like that at all it's just constant noise and it's just like this this crazy kind of energy um shooting baseball for me was like was it's easy it was like easy it was it was it was like okay i've trained it as a photographer now for for a bunch of years i played baseball up until that point for like the last 15 years of my life like i in terms of like game anticipation i knew where every throw was gonna go i knew like the counts where a runner might be in motion so like i was always very acutely aware of what could Mm -hmm. be happening and so i found that to be super easy so the anticipation thing no problem like so you know i hit a home someone hits a home run like i know where all and it's the- kind of an easier easier sport to shoot like in the sense of like you know you there it, it's not as dynamic until yes. someone hits a run yeah everyone's kind of standing still you can get the shots then you can get them hitting the ball and then you get the run it's like there's kind of steps to it versus yeah. you know soccer where everyone's moving around all the freaking time yeah. no one really stops yeah yeah and uh, that's exactly it and so for me it was like man i i haven't really played soccer i have like i had a passing interest in tfc at that moment and and like uh you know i've watched a little bit of premier league when i could kind of thing but i wasn't like super super into soccer at that point like up until that point baseball had been my life for like the last 15 years uh and so that that shift of like okay now i have to like build like game sense i have to build like anticipation it was it was insane it was it was difficult it was really hard and like trying to understand what was going on and like the importance of everything too like i came into this Concacaf run and we ended up going to the final and to be honest i was like kind of unaware of the importance of it as it was happening i was just there like let's capture it let's make it look good like like do i just have to do my job and so it was it was i maybe i was less able to enjoy it and more just like let's just work let's just, just do work thing. get yeah. the work done and like figure it out uh and i enjoyed doing that like i love that sort of challenge like that nervousness of like okay this is a new experience i don't really know what i'm doing but like i'm having i'm having a blast figuring it out yeah um and making good images and yeah we you know there were there's some some really cool cool moments like uh jonathan osorio scoring uh this little back heel flick against i think it was against tigris to uh to go up 2-1 on aggregate going into uh the azteca yeah going back to mexico yeah, yeah. was like 
did you travel with the team at that point or no 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 no. so that was they like i was like basically virtually unknown at that point yeah Uh, i remember that that moment like he came running over to me with this big celebration went past me and And i was just like go 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 go. i was like wow this is cool this is fun and then like i didn't quite realize like the importance of that moment and and then like looking back on it like i wish i had the skills that i have now to capture that moment because i just think it would have been even better but um that was that was really cool, uh, and and so to start the year like that was was really awesome. We ended up, I think, winning um, the Canadian Championship as well that year. I think we beat the Whitecaps. I think I think either Josie Altador or Sebastian Javinko had a hat trick in the final, and that was that was mm-hmm. awesome. And then the rest of the MLS year was was really tough. I think uh, they really struggled with injuries that that year, and it just didn't quite come together in MLS. And so by the end of the year, it was just sort of. The vibe, the vibe was, was down and, and, and that was kind of a bummer to be around, uh, going into 2019, I think, um, expectations were, were a little bit low because I I think the team like really underperformed compared to where they were in, in 2017 and 2016 as well, right there in MLS cup, uh, two years in a row. Um, but then 2019 ended up being, you know, I mean, any Toronto sports fan knows 2019 was, was just the year that was the year for right it to be a toronto sports fan. It, yeah. it was uh so you know, tfc kind of struggled getting out of the gates um and then at the the secondary transfer window they brought in a few players that really stabilized uh stabilized things and then we went on this really awesome like unbeaten run I think it was like 11 games or something we didn't lose uh, as a creative like when you're working with a team that's kind of in their mojo do you find that you also find yourself like in a group like, percent making really good like shooting really good images or creating really good content you know as the team is performing you're kind of feeding off that energy you find yourself doing that a lot 100 percent because it's it's that all again like winning fixes everything it really does you get better photos celebrations you exactly. get better energy from the players 100 they're, they're acting up towards the camera versus when you know you're losing like they just want to go play. Oh, we lost. Let's get back in the locker room. Yeah, it, it it's a lot. And like you know, guys don't want to be, you know, it's natural. Guys don't want to be photographed when they're upset, right? Like you lose a game, it's frustrating. It's difficult to 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 photograph anybody, right? Like it's yeah. just sort of like, look, like I don't, you know, it's not now's not the time, right? And, and I have a good relationship with the players, and and if there is any sort of thing like that, like they'll they'll try to say like, hey man, like now's not the time, and it's super respectful, but it's yeah. just, I understand, right? Like, and now you know it's at at a point where like I I. I'm well aware of like when, when to, when, when, when's when appropriate and, that, and, and, when's you, and that's, that's your experience. That's your experience what, yeah. You know, there are some points where like, you know, I know that like knowing when to go and capture a moment versus stepping back and letting them feel what they feel. It's through experience. Like you don't learn that kind of, you just learn it by being in those moments and then they might be like, Hey, not right now. Or they'll, you know, you know what I mean? It just, you kind of react based off of that. And that just comes through learning as you go. Definitely. And like, even, even being an athlete, like in, in high school and college that, that those experiences, you get it. yeah, you understand like when, when you go through a moment, like through a tough loss, like sometimes it's difficult. You just kind of want to be by yourself mm-hmm. and just, just have that, that moment to just process it. So I totally get it when, when the guys are, the energy isn't quite there. Um, like even even like right now like 2023 has been been a tough year like we, we've gone long stretches without scoring goals and and just making images of like goal celebrations is like such a big part of of capturing the excitement right because you get that like that jubilation that celebration and that's that what joy. performs it does yeah on social media that every time like i mean you talk to any photographer like i don't know if you listened to mark blinch did a did a thing with with sony the yeah. other day and he was talking about that and, he, and it and he you know i i think anyone who does sports photography in Canada would, would agree. And if they don't agree, they're lying that Mark Blinch is the best sports oh, he's, photographer in Canada. He's the, he's the, he's the, the bar. Is yeah, him. that's it. And, and to have somebody like that as the bar, it's great because you're just like, okay, I have, if I can learn from this guy or just even just watch, see how he does. That's yeah. There. But you know, he, he says it and, and it's true. Uh, anything he says, it's, it's like gospel. It's, because he's been through everything and yeah. he's learned that experience. Yeah. But anything celebration is going to perform well. And, and the players are going to love it. The, the team is going to love it. The fans will the, love it. Exactly. And like, that's, that really is like, I always like to look at sports from a big, on a big picture standpoint, it's entertainment. It's joy. You're selling joy. Right. And, yeah. and if the it's jo- an escape for people, a hundred percent. Right. I mean, you, if you want to get real nihilistic about it, like it doesn't really matter. It's not moving the needle one way or the other, but it, it's a thing for people to rally around yeah. and, and, and have a shared, a shared experience of joy and, and, and jubilation. And when the joy comes out of it, when you're not scoring goals, you're not when winning you're games, games, when you're losing games, it's, it becomes hard. It becomes hard to, it becomes hard to really make you can make interesting pictures, but I don't know, like you can't make those really great pictures that, that really, really yeah. 
that are uh you know you capture that emotion that energy because so, that energy sometimes just isn't there yeah uh, but I think that's just part of like the thing with sports. You're going to have the highs and you're going to have the mm. lows. And the highs are really high and the lows are really low. Yep. And I was kind of leading into one of my next questions was kind of like when, you know, obviously when things are great, we just said it, it's easy to create content. It's easy to take yeah. great photos. They're celebrating. They're, you know, the, you see the smiles on the bench. You see everything. When you go through a season like this year, and I'll just use this year since it's obviously still going on. Yeah. They're not really performing to what they want to. It's not really been a great year for the team. Yeah. How do you adjust as a photographer, as a creative to, you know, still pump out quality photos, still capture those moments, even though, you know, you may not be winning as much, you may not be scoring as much, you may go stretches without scoring. How, what are you doing to keep it, to keep it like, to keep your photography and, you know, your skill set useful during this period? It's, you know what, it's a challenge. And, and I talk a lot to our, our team videographer as well about that because we, we focus really a lot on storyline now, right? So with the individual storylines within each game to sort of say, okay, like, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, we take away sort of the, the focus on like, make sure we capture goals. Like, let's just say, all right, let's focus solely on a storyline and see what happens from that. Right. Mm -hmm. So for, for example, like we are in, uh, we were in Miami recently, and obviously they they have a they have a certain guy that's that's well they got three guys that are pretty yeah. important. There's one guy, there's but, one you know, guy, a couple guys, kind of a big deal, kind of a big deal. And he and uh, his his two buddies and Victor Vasquez on TFC all uh, went to La Masia in in Barcelona, and they they grew up as academy players there, so they they've known each other for years. They've been friends, and so when we were there, that was a big storyline. Like, how do we, how do we capture these moments of like Victor and Leo Messi and Sergio Busquets and Jordi Alba? And how do we, how do we work that into, uh, because like it's here, it is like, you know, yeah. like 15 years, 20 years later, like this is, this is where their careers have led and, and like all very remarkable stories in their own right. So, yeah. And I'm assuming too, like being, being a team photographer, like, you know, the goal is to showcase your players. Absolutely. The goal is to tell the story of TFC, not TFC and Leo Messi. Yeah. So it's really cool to me to hear that, you know, you you and the creative team said, okay, look, we, we can't ignore the fact that we're playing the best player of all time. Yes. We have to acknowledge that. And you also know it's going to get clicks. Like, you know, if we're... Yeah. If, well, I mean, engagement's a huge thing, right? Even, yeah. Even like, even ticket sales. Like, it's interesting. Like, the the, the intra... The game by game, different storylines are, are really... They're really interesting. Like, just because like, there's so many different stakeholders, right? So working on team side, it's like... I always I always talk to like photojournalists about it too because photojournalists are there telling game story and they're telling the truth truth. It's not like one or the other. If Toronto FC got blown out, they got blown out. Yeah, and so they're getting these pictures of like our guys like, you know, throwing their arms up in the air and stuff. But they're just documenting. They're just documenting. From a team side, like, yeah, I'll shoot it, but we're never going to use those pictures, right? Like those because from the team side, again, like our goal is to to, to make the team look good, right? Yeah. And make our players look good and, and document it. But... Um, it's not the truth truth I'll say, yeah. right? It's 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 from a team focus. It's from the Toronto fans angle. It is, yeah. You're, you're pitching that to Toronto fans, but that's why I'm saying it's interesting it's because like, you know, I feel like a lot of teams may not have that approach of like, okay, we have to acknowledge it. We want to do it in a 100%. way and you find that connection. I really think yes. that that just takes your photography and the work you're doing a step beyond just taking photos. Yes. You are telling a story. You're being like, hey, Messi has a connection with, with Vax because these other guys too. Let's try to find a moment where all of them are together. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and those sorts of things like, you know, looking back on it, I wish it was pre-planned because the way the game went was... Not great. Not great. We can get to it. We'll get back to that later. Yeah. But uh, you know, those those sorts of things like finding finding storylines within a game. Like even like um, we played Vancouver recently, and, and a former TFC player, Richie Larea, just signed with Vancouver, and and so it was sort of a homecoming of sorts. And so we wanted to get some photos of him, you know, interacting with with his former teammates and friends, and and that sort of thing. So there's all these little little moments here and there that that sort of connect back to the team and the team's history that that helps sort of guide where to go especially in a, in a season where we're struggling uh players making their debut like we just had a we had a goalkeeper luca gavron make his first team debut the other day and and he played last night as well and was uh 
pretty pretty strong performance. It's finding little nuggets here and there to tell stories of you know while you're while the struggle's going on. It's like this guy debuted, this guy had a great performance, and he's a young kid. Exactly. You know, exactly. Maybe, maybe it, this veteran stepped up, et cetera, et cetera. So exactly. You're looking for little bits and pieces amongst the the rubble that would be a you know a disappointing season. Certainly, yeah. yeah. And it's just yeah, it's it's finding the moments that are that are still truly positive, right? I mean, it is difficult. Like, I mean, anyone would agree. Like, it's just not not gone the way that anyone would have hoped, and it's it's been been a frustrating and difficult year for a lot of guys and for the team specifically but i think um i think there there are a lot of positive things to take away it sounds mm-hmm. cliche or you see you hear coaches and players say it all the time like you know if you listen to any of the the, the post game press conferences like oh, like whatever we lost whatever but there's a lot of positives to take away and, and people think that's that's like bullshit but it's not there no, are there yeah, are there, several yeah. things and like you that you have to have that mindset right and it goes back to what we we're saying like there are so many parallels between being a creative and being an athlete. And I, I think they go, they really go hand in hand. So it's nice being in this space yeah. where it's like, okay, like, you know, things didn't It's one go of the great. very few spaces that I think the creative and the subject matter really like there's, there are those parallels. Yeah. Because like, you know, as a, you know, as a creative, you go through burnout, you go through these struggles, you can go through mental struggles of yes. like, you know, not creating the work you want to create or not performing at your peak. The same thing as the athletes, you're working long hours, you're, Early days, late nights, yeah. you know, doing the same, but in a completely different mindset. But that's why there's competing, like competing, competing for roster spots. Yeah, I feel like, like there's a mutual respect yeah. sometimes amongst athletes and creators. Like you know what I mean? Like yeah. even when I when I do it, like you know, they they get it too, yeah. right? And they they want to also kind of help you by coming up to the camera, giving you those actions, and that's a good like it builds a deeper relationship that I think most people give credit for. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. What's yeah. your relationship like with the guys on TFC? Having been around the team now for a few years, obviously there's been a lot of like turnover here mm-hmm. and there in recent years people live pe- people leaving people coming on the team but what's your relationship with the guys on the team obviously you know you're at arm's length you're not mm-hmm. their friend mm-hmm. but what's that like working so closely with a professional soccer team it's it's great and and like at this point i think when i first started it was like a little bit i, I think everybody everybody in sports whenever there's a camera especially a camera in in spaces that are like safe spaces private private spaces exactly Get a little nervous nervous for sure because like what is this like am i like you know guys want to have their privacy they're uh, humans at 100%, the first, that's the first thing yeah 100 percent. like and that's that's number one most important thing to keep in mind is like these guys they're just people like they really are just people um and like the humanized like it, the ad like it's very easy to see them humanized, right? And I think media, our job sort of is to do the opposite. Put them on a totem pole and be like, they're a god. Like, yeah, right? Yeah, like it's all about... It's We're just all talking about, about Messi as if he's this like crazy, like, yeah. you know, mythical creature. He's just a guy. He is just a guy. I mean, he's an incredible athlete, one of the one of the best, best athletes ever, of all time, yeah. the best footballer of all time. Yeah, hands I'm down. glad we can agree on yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a Ronaldo fan, United fan, but I mean... It's hard to, it's argue, hard to argue, argue at this point. point. Messi's yeah. just done everything. Thing and, and just unbelievable but that is it you know we our job is yeah to to present these guys as as larger than life figures um but it, from the opposite standpoint it's like yeah if you're in the room with these guys it's it's really easy to see them as as, as just humans um and uh respecting respecting their privacy is a big thing i i think when i first started the relationship wasn't necessarily good or bad it was just like who is this guy like they're, they're, why Who's is he this here? Guy? yeah yeah, yeah. And, and you know i've been around the club now for a while and, and so all the players the, they know who i am they recognize me if they don't know me on a first name basis they they, they at, least, at least know why you're there yeah me. they recognize me and they understand that yeah i'm with them and I, i'm not you know i'm not trying to do anything to to put them in that's difficult put them in a difficult, exactly right and so um Actually, or one of our former players, Alex Bono, he's with the DC United mm-hmm. last year. Goalkeeper, right? Yeah. Goalkeeper, one of the one, an absolute gem, one of the best people I've had the opportunity to work with. Um, he said something last year that really warmed my heart. He was talking about there, there was some there was some event that the guys were doing, and, and somebody was being told to go cover it, and he was he was upset. He was like, "Why? Like, why are you sending this random person to cover it? Like, we don't trust them. It's going to be awkward. Like, the guys are going to be uncomfortable. Like, why don't you send Lucas? Like, we all trust him." And so that was That's the, such an unwritten part of the job oh, is building man. trust with the athletes because like I think people forget like not that athletes think the media is out to get them, but like you said, there are some journalists, yeah, photo or like whatever, people who had to tell the story. And sometimes they might rub people the wrong way. And that yes. the, the trust is the most important part. 100%. And that's how you get those really freaking cool moments Absolutely. on the field, off the field. Like, yeah. Yeah, that that's that's exactly it. And so that 
that really helped frame it for me where I was like, whoa, yeah, that's they, right. They, these guys trust me. And like my, my role here is to do two things. One, primarily, it's not to take pictures. It's to build trust because I can't do the second job, which is take pictures unless these guys trust me. And so, you know, at this point, yeah, I think I have a pretty good relationship with the guys and like they all trust me. They all know that I, you know, I'm there. How do you build that trust? You know, part of it is, is knowing your place. Yeah. And like, you know, you know, staying quiet when you need to like speak when you're spoken, speak to. when you're spoken to that sort of it's thing. It's not a bad thing. Too. It's, you just, you know, your place. Yeah. And it's, yeah, you know, they're there to play the sport and I'm there to capture it, right? Capture it, capture it capture it well and put these guys in a position where they're looking good in their photos, right? Mm -hmm. Like where, you know, nothing where you're again. Yeah. But you don't want to put people in a tough situation. You're there, you're there to help them, right? You're there to help increase the, their brand presence, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's through the, through the team channels or through their own channels, like we're there, we're there because we want to capture their story. Number one, but also we want them to look good. We want the team to look good. We want the brand to look good. We yeah. want, we want it to be, it benefits everybody. It does. Yeah. All the way to the fans who then get the content. Exactly. Right. Even like, even uh, like players making their debut, right? Like that's a big thing. Like, I, and honestly, I think that's why my role expanded to the point where I now traveling with the team because we had some players work their way through the academy, through like the lower ranks of the second team, and then they'd play their first senior team game. And like that is, is a big milestone, right? That's everything that you've worked for and you're now in a major league, uh, like a you know primary, whatever, number one level league yeah. in football. And, and like MLS is, you know, people clown it all the time, which is so unfair. It's, it's a top 10 league now in the world and it, is the fastest growing league in the world in terms of quality, in terms of uh, in viewership, terms of viewership, in terms of of, of players coming players over. Players coming over. Messi literally said that took less money to come over. One hundred percent. Players coming here. Players like older players coming here. Younger players coming from South America is a great example. Like they'll come here. Um, moving forward, kind of going away from TFC for a second. Yeah. Um, you've also obviously shot for the Leafs. Mm -hmm. You have shot for the Raptors. You yep. did Jurassic Park. You've shot for the Raptors yep. before, right? Yep. yep. How does one, before we get into stories and things along those mm -hmm. lines, how does one get into the position of shooting for almost every, pretty much every single sports team in the city? How do you kind of, you know, take your position with Evel, with TFC and leverage it to then go and shoot all the rest of the teams? Be because, you know, I think we're I know it's not easy to get yeah. to go shoot, especially those big two teams. So how do you, how does, how does, how do you put yourself in position to then go shoot the Leafs and go shoot the Raptors? That is a really good question. I, I don't. I don't really know how that worked out. I mean, I, I, I can tell you how I did it, but I don't know. Yeah, if it, yeah, I don't know it. if it's I don't know if it's a blueprint that that you can follow. But it's different for everyone. Definitely, yeah. So um, let's go back. 2018, uh, beginning of the year. Yeah, someone reached out and was like, "Hey, we liked your work. We saw it with the Jays. Would you be interested in shooting TFC?" I said, "Yeah, I would love to do that. Awesome." So throughout 2018, up until the end of August 2018. I was working with TFC exclusively, um, like on, on MLC side. I, mm -hmm. I had a full-time job. I was a photo editor at a, at a jewelry company. Um, and then at the end of August, I left that full-time role because I was like, you know what, this isn't for me. I want to try freelance. I want to try doing freelance full-time. Uh, and so I talked to some of the people that I knew at MLSC and I said, hey, look, like, you know, this TFC stuff, I really enjoy it. Um, I just left my full-time role and I'm looking for, for some freelance opportunities. Like if you have anything like, you know, I'm a graphic designer, I have some skill doing that. I can do, you know, basic design. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, I'd really like to do more like photo based stuff. And so I, whoever was in charge at the time, um, was like, yeah, that's, I, I'll run it up the flagpole and see, see if there's any, any opportunity. And then within like a week, somebody from the Leafs reached out and said, Hey, like we heard that you're looking for a little bit of work. Like we need some help with, um, with like game day content uh, creation and web content management. So it was literally like you shot your shot. Yeah. I saw, shot my shot and somehow some way it ended up working. Um, and so I started with the Leafs. I started doing like score graphics. So it was like somebody built out a template and I would just throw a picture in, yep. maybe edit the picture a little bit. Uh, I know you said there isn't a blueprint, but I think that's really a really good thing for people to know, especially when you're starting off. Like you don't need to 
look for you you don't need to find that photography job right off the no. rip to get into that role yeah, that's right you just need to kind of find your way into the building yes. and then you know opportunities will pop up right? absolutely and I, I think i think it also goes to show like it's important to be you don't have to be an amazing graphic designer you don't have to like specialize but it's good to have multiple skills multiple skill like a base level baseline skill skill set in a lot of different things like the jack of all trades master of none thing is really really good but i, I think the the sort of caveat or like the altered version of that is you have to be a jack of all trades and a master of one no so i, I actually know there it's the one i've heard is um a jack of all trades is often better than a uh is is sorry there's something along the lines of like a jack of all trades and then there's like the master of one like you sorry what is it jack of all trades master of none master of none but is often better than the mass but is often better than a master of one because you can do more yes so you're more valuable than per one who has you you can have one really really good skill but having other skills surrounding it is better than just having someone who can do one thing very very well and not really adapt to anything exactly yeah because th that flexibility is so crucial in sports mm -hmm. it, it really is it's such a dynamic industry sometimes it's a you know do it like it's the whole concept of like uh, other duties as a sign yeah and that literally like it's just like every i think any job in sports that is mm -hmm. is there to apply for like you scroll down to the bottom of the job requirements the job description it will say that like nine All, times out of other ten other duties right? as a sign and yeah again you 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 may not like the first thing you're doing yeah but I think it gives you an opportunity to meet the right people to put you in the right spot. And, you know, a lot of things that I've heard from doing this podcast and talking to other people, it's like they started off doing something and despite, you know, not wanting to do it, they kept doing it until they said, hey, there's other things I want to do. What can we what how can we put yeah. myself in the position to do that? So I feel like that's kind of what you might have done there doing that first graphic design job, web design or whatnot. And then, you know, what how did you end up going to there through actually taking photos of the Leafs and the Raptors? Uh, I think it sort of started. You know what it was, actually? I remember I remember very specific specifically now so i remember preseason 2018 maple leaf season which is now i guess september october of 2018 this is probably a month now about a month after i left my full-time role and i went in for a meeting with their the content people on the leafs and so they're like okay yeah like this is just gonna kind of go through training like we're gonna you know watch watch a game together and we're gonna just sort of walk you through the process of like these are the score. This is this is how the score graphics are going to go. This is how they should look. These are our partners. You need to make sure that these logos are here, here, yeah, and yeah. here at this time, this time, this time, and this time. Um, uh, whatever. And then this is how the web should should look. And like this is the voice and tone for like headline writing, that kind of thing. Like I would also have to do like very very small recaps until the full like NHL.com writers would would finish yeah. their their recaps. Um, and so. I think it was literally during that meeting, I was just like, hey guys, this is great. Like, I'm so glad that you brought me on. Like, I'm really excited to like help contribute and like help you guys out. Also, I'm a photographer. So like, if you have any opportunities for that. So again, just sort of this thing, hey, like I can put do it, Putting the seat out there and 100%. like, hey, like just so you know. Yeah. And so they're like, oh yeah, cool. Let's keep that in mind. And then, um, have you had Nelson on? I haven't. Uh, I shot it. He's on my list. Okay. So Nelson. Nelson, if you're watching this, you're, you're up next. Hi, Nelly. Um, so Nelson Campana was was doing a role for the Leafs at the time, uh, and I think he had started to started to transition to a bit more of a larger role with the Raptors at that time. And so I think he wanted to take some of the Leaf stuff off of his plate. So he was shooting like fan engagement, sort of like fan perspective uh, of Leafs games. And he like somehow some way we got to talking. He was like, "Hey man, like if you want to cover for me on some Leafs games, like please." By all means, like, mm -hmm. I, I'd love for you I to do I don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that was sort of it. So it was sort of like a, I made maybe not my intentions known, but I said, look, like I'd love to be able to do this. Like if there's an opportunity, please, please, by all means, consider me. And then Nelson, I guess, caught wind of that. Or I'm not entirely sure how that went. But, but it put you one step literally closer to yeah. the players and the action on the ice versus yeah. just being in the office. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and then so that sort of started to happen. And then I guess... Early, very early 2019 was the first time somebody from the Raptors reached out to me. And I did something for the Raptor, Raptors 905. Um, and they liked that work. And then by, I want to say, February, I shot my first Raptors game. And then 2019 was a bit of a whirlwind. And then from that point on, like we made it to the playoffs and I was at every Raptors game. Either well, every I was at Scotiabank or the at, home game, the, the, home, the home games, games and then I was in the park for the for the road games. What was the experience like shooting an NBA Finals game? Like, can because not a lot of people have been able to do that. Obviously, what is that experience? So, you it know, was, it's also you know the team's first appearance in the mm -hmm. championship. You know. 
this team has tried so hard in Final mm-hmm. What is that like from your perspective? You know, was there any nerves? Was there any like going into game? Was it we had game one here or was it game one in Golden State? I can't, I can't remember. remember. Well, let, the first playoff, the first finals game here. What was that experience, that day like for you leading up to it? I'd love to hear your perspective on that. So. The, it was really interesting because my role with the Raptors was almost, it was like, I would say 90% just shoot Jurassic Park. So just the fans, well, the goings on there. So that that was really cool because it's all about just capturing energy, like fan passion. I was in the arena for, I want to say maybe three, four playoff games. And the first three rounds it's pretty easy. You can kind of go wherever you want with the exception of a floor space. But as long as, as long as like you're, you're with the team, you can walk around, go wherever you want. The finals, the NBA comes in and they take over. It's totally different. That I, mean, sound, I, I, it, I know that ex- that's the same with us. It's like, you know, the, for the playoffs, it's all yours. You yeah. guys, but the final, it's like, okay, we're going to put our feet in here and we're going to change it. So I got, I get where you're coming yeah. from. So, so your access to, changes entirely like it, it's you it's just totally 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 different in the finals the energy is so different it's like it's like nervous excitement it's very it's like i don't know if it's like tense but that's sort of that's sort of what it feels yeah. it's just like whoa okay like this is this is important mm-hmm. um and that energy is just awesome it's just the best uh it's having the experience of shooting jurassic park and maple leaf square the same thing uh, but different teams. Uh, basketball is just so much more fun to shoot because hockey, you're waiting for a goal. But basketball, it's consistent. Back- and so when you're out there with the fans, they're losing their minds every five seconds. And I was yeah. gonna, that was, I was gonna lead into that part of my next question was like, you know, you didn't get to be in the building all the time, and you also had away games, but you were able to capture kind of very like the, a moment in history yeah. through the fans' perspective outside, like with in in literally the trenches yeah. of downtown Toronto with these fans watching this happen, like. You know, I think that's a really good lesson to know for sports photographers, especially young guys. Like, you don't always have to be in the arena. It's not to always create sports. Impact. It's not always sports. Yes. And it's like, you know, you don't have to get that shot of Kawhi Leonard dunking on somebody to get a good piece of content that's going to do only well online. Fans, you know, literal emotions are something that like, you did very well in capturing for when I remember. So what was that like experience, like capturing those, 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 especially game five or game one in we game won six, it, game six yeah. when they were in Golden State. What was that like? You know, it was insane. Like it was insane. You know what's funny? I actually sort of remember it as like being anticlimactic because I remember at the end, the end of Game Six, we kind of knew it was like we knew like there there was like I think I think it was Kawhi or Pascal. Hit, I think it was maybe Kawhi hit a free throw, yeah, and it put us up by four or five. And then there was like a whistle, and then like a review, and then like another whistle, and then like a false start kind of thing. And it was just sort of this like jumbly whatever near the end. It wasn't like hockey where it's down to the buzzer and then and then yay it was like okay i think we've won and so it was it was kind of strange so there's like this sort of like this moment like holy shit we, we did it wait have we done it oh it's not quite there yet oh oh and then we won and it's just like pandemonium pandemonium and like just i've never seen the street you've probably never seen the streets of toronto like that never it was awesome it was amazing. I so I remember how long were you out there? Though? I was just gonna say. Yeah. I remember I got to Scotiabank Arena at like I want to say three for in the seven afternoon. o'clock. Seven. I think eight, it was an eight o'clock. Eight tip. o'clock tip. Um, but three o'clock. So like we set up, we game planned. We talked to like all everybody involved, marketing team, social team. Talked to everybody. Figured out all right if we win what's gonna happen you know whatever right so we sit there we have our like our pregame meal and then the gates for for Jurassic Park open I think maybe five like super super early we had a ton of pregame programming um, and then all the stuff on stage gets cleared off and Drake shows up and so he sit he's there like with his friends he's got his couch whatever and he's watching the thing on on the screen with the people yeah and i forgot he was there yeah i knew he was there i forgot he was there for six yeah and and it was like it was this just like it was this crazy thing because like it's just he's this just this character that sort of like at this point is so representative of toronto as a whole mm-hmm. right um and he's there and just a fan, a fan as much as anyone else. Yeah. And, and like the fan, the energy is because they're so hyped because like, wow, we might win a thing. Drake is here. Like, this is crazy. Um, and so when we won, it was 
almost midnight. So at this point, it was like, I was already there for like eight-ish, not seven and a half hours. Uh, and we won. And then like the streets just went crazy. Like people start pouring out of there. Everyone's coming out of the bars, restaurants, out of their houses, like going into the Cars streets. Cars honking. And just, just like hundreds of thousands of people just running around the streets just celebrating like young and dundas square was packed i was there i yeah. was there and it was just ridiculous yeah like people climbing up onto buildings like like flagpole like yeah. fl- like sorry uh, like light poles. light poles it was like it was it was amazing it was just like it was amazing and so euphoria it, yeah and it was just walking around taking photos taking photos and like trying to capture that with the thought in mind that like I'm going to need to stop at some point and edit these and like send them to someone so that like we can put them out for the team. And it was just like, so when, what, at what point in that night did you realize like I have enough and I need to go back because it's hard though. Cause you feel like you're going to miss something. If, yeah. you, if you go home. But like, what point did you kind of decide like, Hey, I need to, I should probably, should probably upload these five. Oh my morning. gosh. I was probably out until five and then went home. And then I think I, I did a pretty quick edit. I think I was probably up until about seven 30. And then went to bed, <laughs> went to bed. And then I woke up or again, like we had to, I forget what it was. We had something else later that day, like the second day to do something. And then we had a few days break and then we had the parade. And then the parade was the same thing all over again, like up super early. I think there was like a million people in the city. Three million people came to the parade. Apparently that is like, that's uncomprehendable. That is unbelievable. Like I, that were you on a bus shooting it or where was I was role? roaming. I think I was the only I think I was the only one roaming because I think it was like me, Nelson, and Charlie. Charlie Lindsay, mm-hmm. also a great photographer. Check him out. Uh, like ridiculous, good tier zero. Those tier guys, zero. They yeah, I know Charlie. Stuff. Um, I forget who else was shooting, but I think for social it was me, Nelson, and Charlie. That whole playoff, and Charlie was at Jurassic Park, or he was not just he was at Nathan Phillips Square. Nelson was on a bus, and then I was just like, go roam and get what you can. And man, like it was difficult to shoot. I got stuck. Like I got, I literally like in, I couldn't move in a crowd in a crowd. It was, it was insane. Um, that day was just insane. I was on the street from probably eight in the morning till I think probably three in the afternoon. Oh my gosh. And then it kind of all died down, died down. And then we had, uh, like a staff party, <laughs> At real sports, which was a lot of fun. There, it's funny. Like there are some really nice moments in sports when you know everyone kind of gets together. When you, you win, you really get to celebrate it. Yeah. You know? Um, and, but there are also a lot of moments that are really kind of tough. Tough. Yeah, yeah. No. I mean, I mean, we just went from like the low of like TFC and you know this year not being great to talking about the Raptors and yeah. and how the how high that. But it was it's so cool to hear that you like understand the gravity of that moment. And I think you know young photographers at times you kind of get lost in the moment. Yeah. But like even now, like for me, it's like I've been to two Stanley Cup finals. And, you know, you, you, I, the first one, I didn't realize kind of at the time what was going on. Yeah. The second one, and I think you might have learned, like with Toronto, you might have seen like with the Raptors versus the first MLS Cup. It's like the second one, I was like, I understand what this means. Mm-hmm. And you understand like you're capturing history. Yeah. You were literally capturing something that's like is in, in, in like in the veins of the city or the organization you work for. And, it, and it's such a, it's such a cool opportunity. There was like, um. I had Taylor Ian really on this yeah. podcast and he just wants, he's one of the things he said, was like, he's like, do you realize that like you get to do something that like 0.001% of the population will ever experience? Like capturing something yeah. like that. It's like, it's unbelievable that you have that opportunity it's, to do so. And it, it, it kind of like, you sometimes need to sit down and be like, Whoa, I really like experienced that. You know, it's, it's amazing. I'm so fortunate. And so I, I'm I, like every day I'm like, man, I'm really lucky. I get to do this. You love what you do. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's no doubt in my mind. It's, it's it's awesome it's yeah it's so it is so important to like i think make sure that you're aware of that i love the and fact not that take it for granted i really like the fact that we're talking about like the actual like enjoyment of our jobs versus mm-hmm. like just like oh yeah this is how we shoot photos so i think that's a really important part of it like you know knowing how to take a great photo is one thing but then appreciating the work that you're doing the impact it has in the in the in the impact of what's going on is so important i i think yeah the that's that's those are two really 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 important things is a like understanding how lucky you are to be able to do what you're doing uh and two understanding the importance of the work yeah right like doing the raptor stuff like i was like man like i'm shape like personally kind of shaping the narrative of how 
how this is going to be documented, yeah. at least from a team standpoint. Right? And you'll, like, you, you'll look at that 20, 30 years yeah. from now. You know, maybe other people will look at it, and, and a lot of those images, especially like of the crowds and like of what's going on in Jurassic Park, a lot of those images will be in history. Be, it's like that's, but that's like I did that, and yeah. it's like it's weird because at the time I was like, ah, okay, whatever, I'm just kind of doing, I'm just doing a job, right? Like I'm here documenting things, but you ever thought about making like a photo book? Yeah, not yet. Not yet. That's the down the line thing. Long t- yeah, retire like close to retirement. Kind of. I'm still so young. Man. Like everybody, <laughs> everybody else, is, like I talk to, that's like in a similar role is like they're older and like there's there's a lot there's a lot still left to be to done. Do. And like honestly, like I kind of suck compared to a lot of these other people. Like I'm okay. Like I take good pictures sometimes. But I think like, you need to give yourself some credit. You're working again. I'm gonna give it a perspective. Like you're doing. You're working like professional person in Toronto. There yeah. are people who'd kill for your job right like so but no i i get where you're coming from. like there's always like that mentality of i could always grow and be better and improve and improve and improve yeah i i, I don't know like i'm sure everybody you've talked to on this podcast has said the same thing yeah 100 percent. and i think also like you said you work with really talented people so it's it's hard not to be driven to keep going keep 100 keep guys like mark guys like kevin de yeah, Souza, Souza, yeah. and then thomas like really talented guys in their own right and i was going to ask you like What's it like working with those guys? We talked about Mark Blinch being like the pinnacle of mm. photography in Canada. If you're saying otherwise, you're lying. Like, what's it like working next to those guys who have seen everything, done everything? How much are you learning from them? And then also, like, how much are you like, you know, not just learning, but like getting to know these guys on a personal level, working these games with them? It's it's great having guys like that in the room that you can just sort of bounce stuff off of, bounce stuff off of, and just. Honestly, a big thing for me is I really just like observing people work and just watching how people work and seeing, just seeing how they conduct themselves. Yeah. Um, one thing that really is amazing to me about how like Mark works and, and Kevin and, and Thomas too. There's and like Nelson even. Nelson, I've, 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 yeah. Like, mentioned him too, but yeah, yeah like all those guys. And, and like, well, if you're at it, like, like, like Tristan and like Vaughn and like, there's just like a certain level of, of just like humility and like they never get too big for their britches we'll say you know it's yeah. just like yeah you know i'm confident in the work but it's like i'm not the i'm not the the show here they're the show like yeah, the athletes are the show exactly and like you know it's just there's like a such like a an honest humility to the way that they carry themselves and the work that they do and it's so it's like inspiring seeing that because it's just like okay like it really is I, and I'm sure, you know, you come across this as people that it's like, it's all about personal brand. And like, that's fair. You can do that. That's totally fine. But I, I think the people that really take themselves out of the equation and really make it about the craft, man, the work is like, it, it is next level. Yeah. I, is I was just talking level. to like a friend of mine the, the other day where we were sitting and we were just talking about some of like these photographers, and like the way they work. It's like, and they just, you don't have to make a fine, you know, fancy caption. You don't have to do it. It's like. You just see the photo and you see, you know, it's a good, you know, it's a good shot no matter what yeah. it is. Yeah. And yeah, just like, just the, the craftsmanship, like it's, it's amazing. And like, even just like talking gear with those guys, right? Like they know every, they've used everything under the sun. They have, and they have all these cool little tricks that they've, that they've built all these little efficiencies and they What's figured like out the all the coolest trick you've learned from like Kevin or Mark oh, or, uh, yeah. The coolest trick I've learned. I'll say Kevin gave me some really good advice. He was actually one of the first people I talked to at, at a Jays game when I first started in sports. He was shooting the Jays. And he, because I was like, I was like, I was rogue. <laughs> I was rogue back then. I was like, rogue. Unhinged. I was like, yeah, I was like, I'm going to be the best at this. I was like, super co- like super cocky, super confident. Uh, and like, I'm going to be the best at this. I might not be, might not be that good right now, but I'm going to be so good at this. Yeah. And he, he just gave me some sort of like, Hey, check yourself advice. But it was also like, if you're going to do that kind of like sneaking into places where you're not necessarily supposed to be to take pictures, he's like, if you're going to do that, don't be an idiot about it. Yeah. Right. It, 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 I, I be smart. Yeah. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was something like, just be smart about it. Like get good. Sh- you can get good pictures by kind of pushing the boundaries, but do it in a way where you're not jeopardizing your job. Yeah. And not jeopardizing everybody else's job too. Right. Where it's like, okay, like why is this photographer here? Now we're going to ban it f- from all the other photographers. So, just being smart about those things. And I, and I think Kevin, Kevin, for better or for worse, he does a really, really good job of continually pushing the lines of where he can and yep. can't be. And I don't know if he's going to admit that. And I don't know if he's going to like that I'm telling him that or saying that. But he does a great job of it and he gets great work because of it, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think that is such an important 
aspect to it is like pushing yourself pushing pushing limits of like what you can and can't do it's can be like an ask for forgiveness rather than permission kind of thing obviously don't push it to the point but like understand like understand like if there's a good if there's a good picture if you see that there's a good shot to be had try it yeah and so i think that piece of advice for whatever reason it stuck with me uh for a really long time Mm. um but yeah those guys are they're really 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 good uh the leafs are really lucky they have a really really great like ever yeah everyone on that squad like all all, like the four of you basically you thomas kevin and and, yeah and and blanche blanche yeah like you guys have a good and i was and i was just gonna go on to that like how did you end up finding yourself working with the leafs because again you had your way to get to the raptors Mm. was it through the connections with those guys that you met that they recommended you or how did you end up getting to shoot for the leafs as well um yeah it was just i guess it was like the nelson thing he was just like yeah i don't really want to do these games anymore i just like i would like if you if you want to cover them i'm happy to give Mm -hmm. them to you i think that was sort of it just um just that and then doing good work like it's it's a good question people ask i'm sure that's what this podcast is here yeah for people ask how did how do you do this like how did you get here but then they, it's it, when you think when you get because i like, get that question yeah. all the time how do you shoot for the nhl how do you shoot yeah. for whatever but it's also just like there's so many things that go behind it it's, yeah. not, it's not as easy as saying oh, i just walked in with the camera like i had to build the relationship that's the biggest thing is the relationship building it's like it's it, that trust again yeah and it's it, building trust with whoever with ever whatever stakeholder it is if it's players if it's team staff security getting to know security guards can change your life oh my god does it ever it makes a huge difference for example i'll just say this i do a lot of other stuff outside of sports right? yeah like i shoot the film festival that kind of thing the there's like one major security company in toronto that does lost like security staffing for large scale events so like jurassic park uh maple leaf square toronto international film festival so a lot of the guys Guys and girls that work security that work MLSC events also do TIFF. TIFF. And getting red carpet access can be difficult. But if you know the security guards... It's like, hey, man. Yeah. And they, and they trust you. And they know that you're not, not there. They're going to fuck there. around. Yeah, exactly. You're not there to like make a joke out of yourself mm-hmm. or like, you know, oh, give me a signature. It's like, you're there because you want to get a good picture and mm-hmm. you want to make somebody look good. So that's a big thing. But yeah, like I was going to say, like the biggest thing in sports and, and like get any job anywhere... There's two things, one A and one B. One A, be nice. Be nice. Like just be a good person. Be a good person. Be good to work with. Like don't be difficult to work with. If somebody sends you an email, send them an email back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, be respectful. If you, someone DMs you, don't just leave them hanging. Yeah. Or like if you do happen to leave someone hanging or you miss an email or whatever, like, sorry. Ap- apologize. Like it's just, crazy like, how how little people think about that. Yeah. Like be considerate is a big thing. Be friendly. Get to know people. Spend some time on site at a shoot. Actually socializing. Forget the camera. Like socialize with people. Just be like, hey, how are you? How's it going? Like get to know people people be be somebody that they want to work with yeah um you can be the most talented person in a room but if no one wants to work with you because of your energy your attitude like you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot 100 percent. that's a big thing and then number two or one b is understand an opportunity and know how to take advantage of it so that means have a strong portfolio that means have a social presence stuff that showcasing who you are and how you can how you conduct yourself and whatnot and knowing that like a you know that that uh, a part-time role with the MLB that at the time I was like nah. crushed about yeah. is a foot in the door. Yeah, kind of putting your ego aside and putting like that behind me. Like this is a good opportunity for me to like set myself up for success in the future. A hundred percent. And even like uh, you know, like, like I was saying, it, shooting sports isn't always sports, mm-hmm. right? Like you can shoot um, something for for an athlete that has nothing to do with sports, other than the fact that it's related to this athlete like community engagement at a community center or something like that or like maybe an athlete reaches out or you could reach out to an athlete and say hey like i'm a photographer Would videographer love, love help you with your brand whatever whatever yeah like maybe they work there's with other a, avenues into the whole into the whole thing exactly sure. exactly i work with a car dealership and like i want to get a picture of me getting my new car or something like yeah, that yeah, like yeah. That, and I, that's like a fairly and that's common a door, that's a way into the into the space yeah. whether one way it's not just through job applications with the big companies exactly and and i think like that's a big thing too is like putting the ego aside of like yes major league sports a lot of people want to work in major league sports but sports are sports are sports like mm-hmm. people say it all the time high school college sports that's super important build a portfolio that way and then 
somebody who does something in a major league sport, if you're doing good work, they'll see you. 100%. We've always spent a lot of this time talking about how many teams you're covering, how many games you're shooting. What's your schedule actually look like and how do you like maintain that? Because I think people don't realize like when you're in this line of work, you you like it's hard to keep track of everything and like organization is super key. Not just like time, but yeah. also file organization, making sure oh. your gear's set. But like first of all, scheduling, like how are you like making sure you're not booking too many things all at once like how are you you know like a lot of these teams and games will play on the, on the same night so what's your like schedule actually look like shooting for all these teams so the way i sort of structure it with mlsc is i'll take tfc will always have priority so if there's a conflict i'll go with tfc um but outside of that it's like uh once the schedule comes out at the beginning of the year so for mls i think the the upcoming season schedule comes out like december january uh, the season starts in late February or early March. Just plug all that into my calendar, all the travel days. And then, you know, from there, everything kind of goes around that. And it's the same with the Leafs, right? So the Leafs season starts once. Do you travel with up. them or no? With the Leafs? Yeah. No, never. I'll do, so if they'd have like a, a local community event. So like uh, last year, I guess last year, maybe the year before, they had the Heritage Classic or, yeah. or the, whatever the other one in Hamilton went to do that. I was just in St. Thomas this past week to Draft do Hockeyville. Uh, Hockeyville. Um, those sorts of things, I'll, I'll, I'll head out there. But the Leafs, no, I don't... I don't mostly care. home games. Mostly home games, yeah. Um, TFC, yeah, so anytime that they, they travel. But with the Leafs, I used to cover all of their road games with, like, web content stuff, right? Yeah, so yeah. I would put that in the calendar, too. So... Just having a very good Google calendar there. That's, that's it. Just having everything plugged in and understanding, all right, that is for sure a conflict day. And then anything else sort of slots into the to the spaces in between, yeah. right? Whatever other clients, right? Like there's a lot of stuff. You run free. You have a freelance business. You have other things going on. Yeah. But I, I think it's important to know that, like you know, when you're in this line of work, like being organized with your schedule is so important because you don't want to double book yourself because then yeah. not only are you fucking yourself over, but you're fucking over the client or yes. the team or whatever. And like, so you want to avoid that. So I was really curious, like having done all like all this work with all these teams, how you do it. And I think that's a really good thing to know. Um, on that same topic, you work a lot and yeah. I think everyone in the sports industry works their tail off and like, it's kind of an industry. You kind of put it on yourself. You know, you're going to have these long hours, these long days, long travel days. Yeah. Um, how do you kind of avoid getting burnt out? Cause like, you know, you're going from TF, you know, it's not like me where I'm working with the NHL and I have an off season. Yeah. You know, I get, I get at, you know, July to September off yeah. and kind of get some time to relax. You are going from hockey season straight into foot like soccer season yeah. slash football with the Argos and then basketball and hockey are at the same time. So you kind of have this continuous cycle. Yeah. How do you make sure you're taking time for yourself to like chill? It's, it's tough, man. It is tough. It is tough. It's, I take my days off very seriously. That's good. Yeah. So like if I have a day off, um, it's your day off, it's my day off. It's like, I'm not, I'm sleeping until one, <laughs> like I'm, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be in bed Tell you one, one, two in the afternoon. Like I'll maybe wake up at like eleven, put mm-hmm. on the TV or something, just like watch some stuff. I am just not like I, you know, I think I've really recently been been into the idea of like sleep debt and like making sure that you pay back your sleep. What debt. do you mean sleep debt? So like if you if you never heard of it. So so yeah, sleep debt's sort of like the idea of like your accumulated hours of sleep. So like. You know, you need to sleep eight hours a day. That's like 40 hours a week, right? You need to sleep kind of thing, 40 hours a week. So let's say you only slept six hours, six hours, right? So you're, you're missing, what is that? 10 hours of sleep throughout the whole week. So re like pay that back. So sleep that like finding that extra 10 hours like of sleep. oh like if so you know you sleep six hours when i trying to get a good quote about an hour early the next to kind of yeah recovery. okay cool. or like you know if you have a day off like take advantage and like rest like fully rest recuperate um you know try to you know go go for a run or like see friends like, see family whatever yeah exactly exactly and, and taking advantage of, of those time and like also if there's for example like uh like an international break in soccer like take advantage like go like we had um we had like two and a half weeks off at the end of July, early August, and I was mm-hmm. like, all right, see you later. That was the first time I took off in like two years. Wow. Like extended period of time off, and I did nothing. Like I didn't didn't open it, didn't touch a camera. Didn't touch a camera. Didn't open my computer for like two weeks. But I think we I think people forget how important that is to take it, care of yourself. I think you only know it until you're in the mix and then you're here and then you're yeah. you're working the long net game nights and then you're realizing at the end of the year, like, man, I'm burnt out. And then and sometimes it's too late, you know what I mean? You have to take those days off yeah. and you're so I really like the fact that you're being cognizant of it and literally making sure you're paying back your sleep debt and not like 
you know, it, we, it, I think people kind of forget the reality of this. Like, you get to shoot sports. It's super cool. Uh, like, you get to work with these pro yeah. athletes, be at these big moments. But people forget, like, it's also incredibly taxing. It, it, that's the thing. is it, Especially when you add travel. The travel is Let, the thing. Everyone thinks let's, I want to talk super glamorous. Oh, you get to fly. You don't fly first class. Like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if TSU charters. We charter, but, but it's not first class. Like, it's like, so M- MLS has a, has a, uh, partnership with a ultra low cost airline mm. in the US called Sun Country Airline and they're wonderful they're great it's you are <laughs> it, there's there's it's like it's it's, it's, it's you're, you're not flying in an Airbus A380 you are like, not yeah. yeah and it's not in a pod like you're in like a church pew row and like yeah you get sometimes you get a row to yourself that's that's nice but you know the, the hours like we get home from a road trip at like 4 in the morning right like it's not it's not particularly you got time you know, change there you have yeah. you know like obviously sitting in those seats for a long haul flight from like say to LA from here, like oh. not fun. And again, I, I, I experienced that in the finals. Yeah. It's like, you know, the it's people think it's glamorous. You get to go all these cool cities, but like there's, there are parts that are great. And like, yeah. I, not to say that it's not like a really fun, we'd be lying if we didn't say it was fun. We, it's really, but there are parts that are, that are, are, that are very taxing. Like the travel is very taxing. Like the long, the long days specifically, the, the travel just extends the days. That's the travel can be whatever, but it's just the fact that it's like, on a game day, for example, um, yeah, give me like the timeline of like, let's say you guys are going to like Houston for a sure, game. Yeah. So if we're finding Houston or Houston, or whatever, we'd fly in the day before. Let's play. Let's say we're playing on a Saturday. So we'd fly in on, on a Friday. We, our team would train here in Toronto, uh, late morning, very early afternoon. And then we'd, uh, we'd train, have lunch at the training ground and then go to the airport, do that, you know, get mm-hmm. on the plane, fly to Houston. We get to Houston at whatever, usually around six, seven, sometimes eight local time, have dinner, go to bed. The next day, wake up. Breakfast is uh, usually between seven thirty and ten, or eight and ten. Um, do like a like a morning walk, uh, just something something active. Yep. Um, lunch, uh, maybe another active thing like yoga, or you know, morning walk or afternoon walk, or yoga in the morning, that yeah. kind of thing. Uh, and then medical staff, media, myself included, will go to the. To the stadium for around three, three or four. Guys get there around five, four o'clock. Yeah, guys will get there usually, usually an hour and a half or two hours before kickoff. Um, and then all of our all MLS games, I think this year start at seven thirty local time. So, play the game. Uh, game will end around ten o'clock local time. Get on a plane. Then yes, yeah, so then there's like after after the game, there's like media availability, so we have to wait, do that, and then get on a bus go to the plane and then fly back immediately. So there's no time to like there's take a second. You are moving no. consistently. You are constantly. You're not, you got that one night of sleep and then you're in, you're shooting the game and, and then, then you're back home and then you're on the plane and then you're back home yes. at four in the morning and then, yeah. Yeah. And that's it. So by then you've sort of been up for like 20 hours straight Yeah, and you can sleep a little bit on the plane, but unfortunately for plane sleep isn't great too. It's not great. And, and for me, like I have, basically my second edit to go through right so i'll do i'll do like live editing of photos as the game's happening and like any there's ma- still work to be done once, once the whistle blows at the end yeah. there's still work to be done and like there's not enough time between you know packing my stuff up and getting on a bus and getting on the plane to go through everything and edit it so uh, you know i'll still be editing on the plane until probably you know a, a, an average game I, I probably still have another hour to two hours of of final mm-hmm. full edit any and for me it's like i'll use any picture that's usable right because on team side like it's the, the yeah. game story is important and I'll have the game story by the time the game's finished, but for, for marketing purposes or for, you know, whatever else, like future news stories, like a player gets loaned somewhere or a player finishes career, that kind of thing, you know, any, any usable picture of a player will submit it. Right. And it, that takes hours to go through everything. And then sometimes there's nice creative stuff that I want to go through and like do kind of things, some, yeah. something for myself or your brand for your socials, yeah. whatever. And you know, and for the team too, right. For yeah. the players, like it, it is important like that. It, it's a huge thing. Like, but it just shows again that like, you know, it's not just like you end the game, your job's done. No. There's still things you got to do and all that on top of flying back, going home, yeah. getting here and going back to bed. Like, yeah. And then uploading, tagging, um, and then uh, even like file management. Like I set aside, I set aside, like tomorrow is, is a Monday and I have booked nothing in and my whole day is just file management. So transferring stuff from my laptop off to a hard drive, organizing the hard drive, just making sure and basically doing an audit of all of my, everything that's on my laptop currently and making sure that it's and that's stuff you're doing for yourself yes. not like paid hours by no. work that's like you you doing invoicing and stuff like that it's stuff that i need to do so that i can get paid but i'm not being paid for the hours yeah. that i'm putting in so it's 
you know, that kind of stuff is also, you know, we were talking about rest and like making sure you're, how do you keep on top of your schedule? Those days are also super important, right? Like I have the luxury tomorrow, I'll be able to sleep in, but I still have a ton of work to do. Um, and that sort of stuff, like even just like, like, uh, like camera health, right? Like making sure your lenses are clean, your sensors are clean, making sure your gear's straight. Yeah. yeah. Making sure like, you know, if, if a screw's coming loose on a lens, you're getting it looked at. If not, like, you know, sending stuff in for repairs, making sure your stuff is getting regu- so regular layers. Serviced. There's so yeah. many layers to this. Yeah. You know, it's not as easy to go and take a photo and then job's done. Like yeah. there's layers to this. There is. And you know, uh, keeping your kit updated, like getting a new body when, when, you know, stuff comes out. Like I, I have, I don't have mirrorless stuff yet. Like I'm still in back. What do you, in the, what do you use? I was, I, oh I, yeah, we're going to do a gear talk, talk. a little bit of a gear, gear here. Cause people, people are curious. I'm not a gear head and this podcast yeah, is neither, about gear. Am I. This gear. This podcast is like, you know, let's talk about the experience, how you got the jobs, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But you know, people like to hear about gear. So what do you, what do you use in a capture images? I use a whole bunch of used stuff. That's an important thing. Totally fine. You don't fine. have to you buy new. Saving money. Um, I have a. I have two Canon One DX Mark Ones and one Those One DX kick. Mark Two. Those they're things they're still good. Kick for Although photos for sure, man. When you compare it to the new stuff, I'm like, I feel like I'm in the dark ages. But the new stuff is expensive. But I mean, no one's no one. In, in theory, no yeah. one is seeing the photo and be like, that was shot on like an A yeah. A one. Or that was shot on like an R6 or whatever. Like yeah. just, you know what I mean? But I get what you mean. Like sometimes like you see what other people are using. You're like, uh. Yeah. So how do you keep yourself from like dumping the dumping the old cameras and buying buying the new gear? What keeps you sticking with those cameras? Money. 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 It's hard, man. It's expensive. Oh, sure. New stuff is so expensive. And, and again, like, uh, you know, it's it labor of, of love still. But so. I mean, if the gear is working for you, you're still able yeah. to capture these images. Like yeah. if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. Yeah. That, that's exactly it. And I think it's sort of my, my sort of mentality is yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, I, I'm a big believer in, you only really need to upgrade your gear when you need to upgrade. your. It's gear. like you, you, you outgrow it. Yes. So like when you know, people ask like, Oh, like what sort of lens should I buy? I'm like, or should I buy this lens? Like there's a moment when it's like, you know, you need to buy, you know, yeah. I think we've talked about this before, like in, in past, just like people like young photographers will often ask or young videographers, like, should I buy this like 24 to 70 years? It's, it's just like you reach a moment when you know, that's the lens or the, the body or whatever. Like that's the piece of gear that you need mm-hmm. because the idea is there. And you're like, I can't execute on this idea without this piece of yeah. gear. And when you reach that moment, then it's time to pull the trigger. Yeah. Like for me, like I use a Sony a6400 like mirrorless camera yeah. for years, like yeah. for four, four years straight. And then there just came a point where like I, the, this a7S3 came yeah. out and I saw it and I'm like, that seems great. Like, you know, I knew I outgrew the capabilities yes. of the little thing I had before because I wanted the extra punch that something like this gave. Yes. So it's like, when people, but, you, but you know, but I knew because yeah. like, and I think also just like when I was grading the images and seeing the footage, I'm like, this could look so much better. Yes. And then that's when I'm like, okay, I think I, I've, I've been able to max out what I've been yep. able to capture with this camera. I know it's time to upgrade. And that's the thing. Like, I like to say gear doesn't matter until it does matter. Yes. Until you really need yes. to like, so, I mean, for your case, you're using like one DXs and whatnot. And you're saying like, obviously like you're seeing what other people are using, yep. but you know, right now that it's still, you're able to do the job effectively and to the highest level that you can. Yep. One day you might be like, okay, now it's time. I yep. gotta, I gotta move on. What's your dream camera then? What, you know, when that time comes, what do you, what, what are you thinking of upgrading to? Uh, you know, I, I dabbled in the Sony stuff. Okay. Uh, I had a, a seven three. Nice. Which I didn't like to be really? honest. Yeah, I had it for a couple of months, played around with it. I couldn't find the right color. The color was a little bit off. So, Canon colors are just so so good. They're really good, but the new Sony, like the the high, like the the A one and like the the A seven S three, yeah, the A seven A seven four is like it's amazing. They fixed the this the color after the A seven three. Um, so I don't know. I mean, mirrorless is definitely the future. What lenses are you using on a on a game day? Uh, I use right now. I use usually three or four. Um. I have a uh, Sigma Art 14 to 24, which I love. It's super wide. It's sharp enough for a wide angle lens like that. Uh, I have a Canon 24 to 70, uh, and then a 70 to 200. 24 to 70, 70 to 200. Those are the two. You gotta have them if you want to work in sports. If you want to work in events, like shoot weddings, 
those, I shoot weddings too. And I, you, you use those all, are the two. Those are the big two. Yeah, and then uh, and then I I bought a used four hundred two point eight. That was the most expensive thing I've ever bought in my entire How life outside it? of a car. I got it for sixty five hundred. Holy moly! Yeah, and those things regular the new one is like what eighteen thousand. That is wild. So that was not a that, cheap hobby. That profession. Yeah, that was a game changer. Uh, I took a loan out for that, and I thought I'd be paying it off for like two years. Uh, actually, ended up paying it off way faster than I thought. Worthy investment if you can find one for the right price for yeah. you. Um, they are hard to find. Not a lot of people have them and not a lot of people sell them. Because when you, you have buy them, it, you keep it, you keep it forever. Yeah. What's one piece of gear that you found that you didn't think you'd like, but you find yourself using all the time? Whether it's a lens, one of the bodies, Ooh. or an accessory even. Like, you know, I don't know. Like, yeah. what's a piece of gear that like is completely underrated that you think more people should take advantage of? Prime lenses. Yeah. I bought, so I shoot weddings as well. And I really wanted to get an 85 one four. Because it's a great lens. I found an 85 1.2. Even for said, sports, eh? Yeah. I use, I pretty much exclusively, I've ditched right now for the time being, the last little while, I've ditched my 70 to 200 and I just use an 85 1.2. But the, the depth of field on it is probably. If you nail it at like, I'll say like 1.2, useless. There was. So, so soft. There was, 1, a, 4, useless. there was a time I was using. I had the the little ace like the APS-C Sony, the, my old camera. Yeah. I would use this for video, yeah. and I would use that for photos. Yeah. And I was still at Ryerson shooting basketball out there, and I would throw a fifty-five millimeter on yeah. with like APS-C conversion. It's like an eighty-five. Yeah. And it would take some unreal, yeah. crispy, sharp yeah. photos. And like even now, like I shot a game, and I, this was just prime lenses. I totally agree. With. I shot a like the um, Global Jam. Yeah, happened, yeah. And I shot that, and there was a there was one quarter of a game. I had that thirty five sitting right there. Yeah. Um, I had a, a friend lent it to me, um, right there. Uh, I had a friend friend lend it to me, and I'm like, you know what? I'll try shooting shooting sports on a prime for once, video wise. Yeah. And it looked because it's 35, so it's yeah. like kind of like a pretty good general yeah. focal focal length. Well, 35 and 85. If you're gonna get two prime lenses, yeah, those are, go with and those. And it two. looked it looked awesome. And no, I mean, no one's gonna tell the difference, but like so sharp. So so I love the fact that you said prime lenses, yeah. and I think they're definitely like if you know, especially if you have multiple bodies, yeah, just throw it on yes. one of them. And then, you know, use it here once in a while. And like, I think that's how you grow as a creative is trying different things. Yes. And you know, you don't have to buy the lens. You could rent it. You could borrow from a yeah. friend, but it's cool to know that you're also like trying different things like that in, in order to grow your, your creative kind of, you're the product you give the photography. You're trying to grow it by trying different things like that. And that's yeah. awesome. Well, and I think it goes to show also like a big thing about this sort of role is being diversified in your skill set right so shoot a lot of different things like i said being a jack of all trade master that doesn't necessarily mean also have different skill sets but like in different, fields. different things work use do photography or do videography whatever it is you're doing but do it in different fields like do weddings like weddings and sports are have a lot in so common. similar. I say this wedding, all people, the time. People are and like people are like the, you shoot wedding because I shoot weddings soon. People are like why do you yeah. shoot weddings? You shoot like the NHL. I'm like they're way more similar than you think. And they're I would say weddings are actually harder. They're harder, but the one thing I love about weddings is like when you shoot sports, it's a different level of pressure. Right? Yes. You shoot a wedding, and and a lot of people who shoot weddings are like wow, this is so intense, it's so high pressure, right? If you shoot sports and you go into weddings, you're like, this is a breeze, right? In sports, if you miss a shot, you'll get a dunk. You'll get a dunk another day. If you miss a yeah. dunk, you'll get a dunk another day. Yeah, right? yeah. But like, if I, for example, like Kawhi's shot, you miss that shot, you might not get that ever again. On a wedding, if you if somebody walks in front of the camera like during the first during kiss. the first kiss, you can just ask them to do it again. It See, doesn't I, matter. I was about to say the yeah. opposite because of what I always relate yeah. to it's like, well, I mean, the Kawhi one is such a different moment. Yeah, but like you know, if you're shooting any game, like you're gonna get a ton of dunks. You're gonna get that's a, also true. You're gonna yeah. get you're gonna get goals in hockey. You, See, do you know, different things. But but the thing is, when I'm shooting a wedding, yes, you can get that moment, but you can only capture a, a, a newlywed bride and groom's first kiss, the real first kiss once true if it's out of focus if someone walks in the frame you're never getting that moment back you can i never thought about that yeah you can ask them to do it again and like they might not know however in my mind i'm like i totally just fucked up their first yeah. kiss so I, it goes both ways that's, but that's the thing is like just knowing that like in sports it's like you don't always know when something's going to happen with a wedding it's like it's like everything is a script they're all pretty much the same yeah and it's like you just know when that's happening so mm -hmm. like if you miss it it's kind of on you to be fair if yeah. someone walks in front of you then fine you can blame them and then you just you know you, get them to do it again and be yeah. like hey sorry like bozo over here yeah yeah your uncle the one who was uh, in the aisle with the camera the cell phone camera oh, right? yeah. oh my god 
I, but, but I know what you mean. But they are very simple. It's also yeah. similar. Like there's a story involved. Like yes. you're, you're you're from the start of the game, from the start of the wedding. There's a story you need to follow to yeah. capture, and you're you're capturing whether in this case it's someone's personal history. Yes. In sports, you're capturing like the history of the team or the city. So they are very similar. I wanted to ask you too. Like one of the questions I had was like you you have a portfolio that is way beyond just sports. Yes. Um, I remember during the pandemic, you started shooting things for like restaurants and their Uber yeah. Eats profiles. You know, you you have diversified your portfolio a lot. How have you? We just kind of talked about it now. How have you found that has helped you grow as a sports photographer in general? It's, it's, it's learning different techniques and just applying them back to sports, right? Uh, like, for example, like a flat lay. Like, uh, you know, you shoot from above, down. Uh, if you can find a location to do that in sports, it's awesome. Like, the before the Rogers Center renovations, you could do that with the bullpens. Like, you could go up onto the, the 200 level, stand right above the 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 warm up mound like the the rubber yeah like a straight where the guys warm up and you could shoot straight down on a pitcher throwing his warm up pitches that's awesome I have this one awesome picture and I hope you can splice it in yeah yeah uh, <laughs> for for editor yeah for, yeah yeah uh, of uh, Francisco Liriano when he was with the Blue Jays and he's just like taking a warm up picture and it's still one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken and it was it's I guess like six years old now seven years old now. So, I don't know. I don't know. But you to learn that because you you're doing the other things yeah. with, the, with the flat lays and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. You, you, it's just understanding that like changing, you know, your environment, changing your environment, changing the subject, the subject, changing the way that you position the camera. Right, like ninety. This is a big thing that we learned in in like photography school, which was like ninety percent of pictures are just someone standing eye level taking a picture. That's it. So anything you can do to change the angle, the angle from that. You're already coming out ahead. You're in the. You're already in that upper ten percent because ninety mm-hmm. percent of pictures are just like someone standing taking a picture, and that's like okay, fine, great. You can get some good pictures yeah. that way, but that's kind of boring. I mean, it's it, and it's so interesting that you learned that. From, I mean, from school even, yeah. but like even through wedding, something I learned is just like establishing where you are. Yeah, because you're doing. I mean, wedding films like you know you're telling the story, you're showcasing where someone is, like the the venue, like the details. Now I find myself when I'm shooting sports. And I did a whole YouTube video on this. It's like taking establishing shots. Yeah. Because whether it's me editing it or someone else, there's always something good to have that context. And that's just, you know, I just learned by watching wedding films, people doing these beautiful landscape shots of the, of the, of the, wherever they're getting ready or the actual venue. Yeah. And then I find myself like in an arena and I'm like, oh, like, you know what? Let me just shoot like the sky looks really nice yeah. with, the, with the, with the team flags in the background. Like it's, there are so many things you can take away from other genres of content creation, yeah. of photography, of videography. And it's really cool how to see people apply them down the line in their actual line, which is sports. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the reality is, is the industries, the subject matter, that always change. But visual language is visual language, and mm-hmm. that's that is universal. You don't, you know, it it's not specific to one one culture, yeah. one language, you know, one industry, whatever. It's a good picture is a good picture is a good picture. Yep. A good video is a good video is a good video. Like hundred percent, you can apply anything to everything and everything to anything. And I think that's so important to have a diversified skill set and a diversified portfolio of experience to draw from because if you don't have that you're gonna you're gonna fall flat you're gonna run into into you're gonna run into issues yeah you're not gonna grow I no know never what yeah. are your, what are some of your favorite projects you've done that aren't sports related oh man to give us an idea the viewers an idea here um there's a lot there's a lot give me like your favorite three Favorite three. Um, I am still trying to produce a TV show okay. called First In, Last Out. But that that to me, was it's like a passion project with me and, and two friends that uh, are both in the restaurant and, and hospitality industry. And we wanted to really wanted to create a documentary series centered around... Um, around the people that are actually doing the work in restaurants. That's awesome. If you think of like chef's table, yeah. that sort of idea, those are great shows and they're awesome. They're really insightful, but they're mostly centered around ownership and head chefs. And like the reality is there's the reality, more to it. There's a lot more to it. And at that level, they have taken sort of a back seat, right? Like they've sort of created sets of standards, created menus, but then they have other people execute on their ideas, which is great. However, no one gets to know that. No one gets to know that. And I'm so interested in, in, and the people who who are first in, last out, the people who open the restaurant and close it down, what's their day to day like? What like that's awesome. Yeah. So I mean, we've been trying to trying to put that out there. We created a pilot several years ago during the pandemic, uh, but super proud of that and really want to see that still grow. Um, what else? What else? There's a lot. I shot a lot of stuff in fashion before. I've shot a lot of stuff for different restaurants that uh, that really, you know. 
to have a good like a special place in your yeah what about sports stuff let's 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 talk about that give me i was going to ask you give me your top three coolest things you've shot in the sports world oh man that's i hard. know that's a lot but what are you like the first three that's sticking out sticking on your mind photos moments that you've captured that like really mean something to you or or just generally your favorite photo you've ever taken there's like three that sort of come to mind. There's one, Sebastian Juvinko celebrating a goal right in front of me during the 2018 Canadian Championship, Canadian whatever, Canadian Championship final against Vancouver. Um, he, yeah, he's, I don't know, he scored a goal and then he came and celebrated right in front of me and just the lighting was like so perfectly dramatic. I think there was actually a light, like a bank of lights at BMO Field that was like malfunctioning and it was out. So it's like this very like, dramatic. very dramatic light. Um, that photo to me just kind of stands out as like, that was a good one. Um, there's the one of Drake on stage when the Raptors won in 2019. I think that to me was just like symbolic of a sim- lot of symbolic of a lot of things. Yeah. I, I think that just sort of really captured it. He's like spraying a champagne bottle. I think that sort of just captured the energy. Um, and like, you know, for better or for worse, Drake is, is the face of Toronto, I mm-hmm. think. And so I think just having that captured, is cool and that's a pretty special moment for me um oh i don't know third one top three sports photos i mean uh in terms of like cool stuff i've done i don't know I i'm don't, surprised you I didn't say the messy photo and i was gonna that was the yeah, next thing i, was gonna bring I, up. Know, I, was I feel like it's a bit of a cop out so here, so we'll talk about the messy, the messy. Yeah. Game. So you, we, we, we touched on it earlier. Yeah. You know, you, you guys wanted to give that focus on shooting. You have Vasquez, him, Busquets, and uh, Jordi, Alba. Jordi Alba. Yeah. But you know, you got to do something that not a lot of people have gotten to do is yeah. shoot the greatest soccer player yeah. of all time. Now with Inter Miami, yep. you guys flew to Florida. They played them. You know. You, you you took a photo. It yeah. was on your feed. And it the was, caption was "Stop asking me." <laughs> I'm assuming you had a lot of DMs and messages yes. like, "Hey, where's the messy photos?" Yes. What, yes. What, what, what was that like getting to shoot that game? Obviously, you're there for TFC, but it's hard to ignore the presence of you know someone that we that the sporting community sees as this amazing yeah. top level Hall of Fame worthy athlete. Like, what was that all like? It, it was cool. It was really cool. I mean, it, from the moment that he signed with Inter Miami, everyone was like, "Wow, that's going to be really cool." I, I can't wait for that. Um, the energy going into that was really awesome. It was super excited. Um, it was it, it was the guys were buzzing like just top top to bottom team staff uh players coaching staff everybody on that knows it's a big deal yeah it's it's a, it's massive right and, and it's a big opportunity for the players i think they all really understood that like okay like this is an opportunity the eyes of the world are on me right and being able to like show up and show out in a game like that can have a really really big, big in, if, yeah if impact you're, if on you're the, a on guy the who holds Messi to no goals and you're defending him really yeah. well like it it's a good showcase for yourself yeah unfortunately didn't happen that way it didn't happen that way and it went probably about as bad as it could go from a storytelling standpoint mm-hmm. and that is one of the difficult things about sports like we're talking about weddings being a little bit more malleable if things go wrong you can say oh can you redo this again in sports you don't really have that luxury because you have really no control over yeah. what's happening um, so yeah, we really wanted to focus on, on the four, the four, uh, La Masia graduates. Yeah. Uh, so the, all the former Barcelona players, Victor Vasquez on TFC, Leo Messi, obviously Sergio Busquets, Jordi Alba. Um, and we wanted to just capture them on field interacting, right? Like, uh, Victor and Messi, Victor, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Um, 11 minutes into the game, Victor Vasquez left with a, with a calf cramp couldn't play anymore so that was that was really unfortunate from a tfc standpoint um but you know the 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 sort of storyline then pivots okay like how do we how do we still make this worth featuring yeah so then it's okay let's capture our guys playing but like let's make sure that we capture Messi because the reality is from from a marketing standpoint it's important it is important um and anyone listening oh it's propaganda it's propaganda but it, it's like when LeBron comes to play Raptors. It is like you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna put that out there because he's the, you know, the greatest player in the NBA, yeah, right? Yeah, and it, and, and like part of the job working team specific is is making sure that things that are marketable and sell seats um, are captured. Um, and so we wanted to get some photos of Messi 
playing against playing you against our guys. Right? I remember o- Osorio posted yes. two photos of him playing against Messi with the caption "Dios," which is God. Yeah. Big ten, and I, I could tell like there's something there for them too. Like they yes. get to play against their like literal probably an idol. Yes, and and so that that was then then became my focus. How do I how do I center our guys against the guy with this guy? Um, but then Leo Messi comes out in the 37th minute with an injury and then Jordi Alba came out with an injury and then everything goes downhill and then yeah we ended up uh you know we ended up losing I think the one photo you the one photo you captured Mm -hmm. what was what went into that you know it's kind of like an over the head shoulder he's looking up you see his name on the back what 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 went into capturing that um it was the only time that I had an opportunity to get that close to him so again working team side we are afforded really really incredible incredible access it's as if we were, were coaching mm-hmm. staff. So we can be pretty much anywhere. Anywhere. I mean, realistically, we can be on the field. Like, if, for example, if our guys score a goal and, like, they run over to, like, the touchline, I can, like, run out onto the touchline and photograph them while, while it's happening. Mm-hmm. That's that's fine. Like, I have access to do that. Um, so during the national anthems, oftentimes I'll go out, follow the, follow our players on, and, and whatever the storyline yeah. is, if it's, you know, a player making his debut, we'll get a... a Returning maybe, home or something. Yeah. Exactly, right? Get a, get a portrait, like, over-the-shoulder portrait, uh sometimes front-facing portrait of, of a guy standing in the lineup for his first time. And you time. saw number 10 and you're like, I can't help myself. Yeah, I have to. I mean, it's, it's, it's important for, it's important for, for you, for, for, well, yeah, it's good for my career, but it's, I think more importantly, it's important for the, for the brand, like for the team, right? Like for, for TFC, we, we want to be able to market this guy, uh, you know, down the line. Um, because it's, it's a big deal. People will want to attend the TFC versus Inter Miami game yeah. next year. So first and foremost, hot ticket. First and foremost, the thing in my mind is like, how do I, how do I get? I want to get this picture for me, but I also have to say, okay, if it's not in line with, you know, the, the actual job description, then unfortunately, I'm not really gonna at liberty. To do and that's that. good because you're kind of putting your ego and you're like, you have want to. aside, and you're like, I need to do what's best for the team. And I think that's important to know. It's like sometimes it's not about capturing the big name; it's about just doing your job. Yeah, it is. It is, and it, it, it says, you know, sometimes in those situations, there's a big name. How do you? weave it together right so yeah it was literally just like he's standing there he was because he's the captain he's closest to the referees which also means he's the closest inter miami player to the tfc players so i'm shooting our guys Mm -hmm. um but trying to frame it so that Messi's in the shot as well and there's another shot and i'll send it to you so you can post it or throw it up throw it up right here points (laughs) (laughs) um of our guys lined up and leo messi at the edge of the frame and so Again, those sorts of things, it serves the purpose of, okay, here's our guys against the greatest of all time. And so having the opportunity to sort of just walk up behind them during the anthems and just and just snag a close portrait, couldn't resist. Had yeah. to. Had to get it. But it's good that, again, you're, like, you're, you're, and I think this is the thing, like, a lot of people think, like, you get, like, you're, you get the opportunity to shoot these celebrities, because that's kind of also what they are. Yeah. But it's also, like, you, you did it with the intent of, like, I'm doing this because I know it's messy, but I'm doing this because it also lines up with what I'm doing. You made sure to frame it exactly the way that they're standing there with him. It's not just him. Yeah. Obviously, you just have your portrait of him because, you know. I'm for, there. Yeah. I'm, you're there. Um, what were the DMs like? Because clearly your caption said, <laughs> stop yeah. asking me. What? Uh, so, so many people that knew I was going to be there, they were like, did you get to see Messi? Are you going to see Messi? When are you going to see him? Are, what are, are the photos? Show me yeah. the photo. I know you took a photo of so, Messi. And it was funny because like, I, you know, I, I have a pretty organized Instagram feed and I haven't posted anything since May up until that point. And I just is like, you know, I'm just kind of just, you got a shit. nice aesthetic going on. Yeah. And I, I just, I don't know. I, it's funny. Cause like I find, I don't know if you find the same way or not, but like when you shoot a lot of stuff that ends up on social media, you try to pull back. I personally pull back a little bit from social media cause I don't want to be on it all the time. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know what? Like enough. It's like, I've had enough people asking me here it is. Yeah. Here's the picture. Um, and yeah, so I, it was it was nice. That's it's, funny. That's it, funny though. Though you know, there's the kind of like people also know you're there and like family, friends, whatever. Yeah. But it, it was an awesome shot. And I'm sure for Thanks. you, like that's something you're gonna remember, like down the line. One day, one day, show your kid and be like, you know, this yeah. was the guy, and I got to start. Like it's something you're also never gonna forget, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it was it was really cool. It was a really it was it was a strange experience. So like I said, like it it went probably as poorly as it could have gone. But it was still it was still a remarkable experience. Even just like the security presence around him, and around the stadium was was something uh, like you've never seen before. Yeah, we were there last year, and like you know, all respect to Inter Miami, all respect, but their stadium is bottom three in MLS. It's not great. Their new stadium is going to be outstanding. Have you gone through the plans of that? No. no oh no. my god. 
I mean, now you have, they have to put the money in. Now you, yeah. have, you got 10 over there. So it's amazing. But their stadium right now is, is a temporary stadium and it definitely feels that way. And we were there last year and it was like, it was kind of mid. And then this year, just even just the small little infrastructure upgrades, like mm-hmm. the, the expanded seating, it's just a totally, totally different vibe. Um, it just, just to see them, you know, the fans, even the, the environment, fa- the, the energy, vibe, is so the energy. Different. yeah. It, it, well, how do you think Toronto is going to be? You know, I'm assuming Inter Miami will, will play here next year at some point. It's that, packed. That, yeah. You know, it's it's the funny thing, right? It, it's all with with Toronto, like TFC. We draw really well. Oh, we you have, guys! Have, I, I always I've always said it. TFC probably has the best environment to be in. Absolutely. Next to the Raptors on the playoff, like Raptors in playoffs. Yeah. Like I think TFC. Sorry, Leafs. Like I think TFC. Like it's just the culture around like soccer. It's it's amazing, and and like I said earlier, like in 2018, like on that Concacaf run, it's like 37,000 people, and it, they're all loud. They're all chanting in unison. It is unmatched, and I'll say it even it it's better even than Raptors and playoffs. Like when it's really that loud, we just you know unfortunately it the last time we were like a really competitive team, uh, we were it was pre-COVID and then the COVID year we, in 2020 we were also really competitive but obviously we couldn't have people in the stands here um, so it's been a little while since it's, but next, it's been that, rocking that'll be like packed that. up next year when Miami comes Ooh, to town yeah it will be and the thing that really excites me about MLS especially MLS in Toronto is we are such a diverse international city a lot of Latino there's there's so there are so many intelligent and like very football soccer forward fans here um, and, and so, as MLS continues to grow, like we I, saw I when Insigne came, yeah, like it, the Italian community just rallied around crazy this guy. For it. Yeah, and, and it's just having having access to such a diverse internationally, Perfect, like it's just yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, it's just the, the the way that Toronto is is so unlike any other city in the world, with the exception of like the New Yorks, the Londons, the, the Los Angeles, yeah. yeah. It's, it is truly like a global metropolitan city and just having like that attitude, the aptitude, that, that, uh, appetite for, for football here is, is really exciting. So when Messi comes, it's going to be packed, but, but that attitude, it's like, as MLS continues to grow, like there's just the sky's the limit for, for TFC and MLS. Like it really excites me being part of that. So that's awesome. I can't wait to see. Like the World Cup is here in, in 26, 25, yeah, 26. We've got two and a half years. Yeah, it's here. So, I mean, we'll see. They're, I think they're going to expand the stadium to, like to yeah. 55,000 or something, something like that. Yeah. And that'll be another good showcase of like what. And I think Messi coming over to the to MLS is so big for North American soccer yeah. ahead of something like the World Cup here yeah. in North. Like, and I've been I've been talking to other people who work in like in football. And it's just like knowing that he's going to be here next year, the media attention around that. Like, yeah. It's going to be a, an event. Yeah, it, you're going to mark it on the calendar as soon as the schedule is released. Like, you know. No. It's going to be massive. Yeah. It's going to be massive. And it's, yeah, it's, I can't wait personally. Yeah. And, you know, I hope to see so many people that I know on the sidelines yeah. there. That's, no, that's a, be a huge goal for yeah, me. I right? think, I think there'll be a lot of people applying for media passes. Yeah. Moving forward. Um, we're going to start slowly wrapping it up here. We got some questions from a few people, but I'm going to go through some quick, like a quick yep. round of questions. I'm just going to give you a prompt and you can give me what I'll comes give you one word answers. Hopefully. You, no, I mean, if you want to, if you want to <laughs> give a little more, you can, but um, start off. Canon, Nikon, or Sony? Canon. Why? Love it. It's just what I started with. It's ease of use. The color is amazing. If you're taking portraits of people, skin tones render perfectly. If you were to use only one lens for the rest of your career, what would it be? Uh, the new, what is it, 100 to 300? Or mm-hmm. the, Yeah, I haven't used it once, but I, it's a 100 to 300 two eight. That's a perfect lens for sports. I don't have it yet. I've never used it, but I know it's good. Okay. Um, what's the best gear purchase you've ever made? 400 400 uh what's your biggest sports photography pet peeve that you that you do or that you see in other people oh don't people who don't straighten the horizons oh my god straighten your horizons straighten your horizons or find a vertical line and just anything that's like off oh Yep. It's just, it's such an, sometimes e- you can do it artistically. Yes. You can do it. Artistically, you can do but it, like, it has to be intentional. Like a guy running up it, like up an incline, make an incline and make a guy run up it or like run down it. But it's such a simple way to make your photos look clean, professional. Yeah. If you're not straightening your horizons, it's like often if I'm shooting quickly and just editing, like just literally like, here's a picture, go. It's just, and even if it's going to an editor and they, they'll crop in, I will still straighten the horizon. 
Because I sometimes editors won't do that. And I'm like, why does it look like crap now? Yep. Straighten your horizons, number one, most important thing, easiest fix to, to yep. get started Super to make easy. your stuff look good and polished. Um, what's your dream event to shoot? Dream sporting event that you, I mean, you know, if you can say I'm all, but like what dream that you haven't shot yet. Dream event to shoot would probably be there's a lot. There's a lot. I, I mean, I really want to shoot a World Series. I really want to shoot an Olympics. I really want to shoot a World Cup. Um the Stanley Cup final would be really cool, but specifically if the Leafs are in it and winning it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot. I mean, shooting an NBA, like to do, be able to do that at such an early age oh, it's incredible, in my career, dude. it was like, and like the parade and everything, that is going to be really tough to top. Yeah. Um, most overdone trend in sports photography. Presets. Yeah? Yeah. What, like, what do you mean by pre, like just selling presets or like, no, or, or just using presets? Presets are a good, I think they can be a good base, but I think presets aren't good mm-hmm. every it takes every, away an, as, an aspect of the art it does it does and every arena every lighting stadium, is different every lighting changes every day by the minute it's not a one fix a one one fix no. all solution so i think for video i think for video you have a lot more because like having a consistent clean whatever something consistent across the whole yeah. thing makes a ton of sense and but I think for photos like for photos like you want timeless less maybe less stylized but like you know you want it to be like last last the test of time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um what was your first camera canon powershot s5 is wow it was like a little point shoot yeah it was like kind of a big point shoot oh really do you still have screen. it or you i have it somewhere yeah nice okay yeah i bought that off of john bruce do you know John Bruce? Yeah, I do know John yeah, Bruce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to throw up the questions here that people ask to wrap up. From Colin, do you know Colin Wuda? Yeah. Yeah, so first question coming from Colin. What are the woes you experience in the sport media industry? The woes. Um, a lot of rejection, right? I think that's a that's a super common one. Massive. Moment. Everybody experiences at the beginning. A lot of rejection and just... Just trying to figure out how to move past it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I always say to people like you're going to get more no's than you're going to get yeses. Hundred percent. But if you're good at your job, if you're good at what you do, like you, those yeses will come. Like before I got to the NHL, I got like several no's from teams and yep. and leagues, and it just it is what it is. It's part of it. It's yep. the hardest part. But like I think you know you, you make the best of it and you use it as motivation too. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, and maybe another one would be like the financial challenges of keeping up with new gear. Mm-hmm. That's tough, but it's. Uh, it's an investment in yourself. It's an I, investment in, in, in yourself and in your work. That's yeah. For sure. I think at, at the beginning part of your career, it's harder than it is. As you become more established, you can justify the, the investment. But yeah, that's great. Um, this person asks, I don't know how to pronounce your name, so I'm not going to. Um, any tips for beginners how to get into soccer photography? Shoot Keep soccer. Yeah. Yeah. Like anything close, anything local. Um, again, like we said it a ton of times on the pod, like sports isn't just sports. Right. Reach out to athletes and say, hey, I'm a photographer. I'd love to do like a lifestyle shoot with you. Yep. Anything, just just anything and everything. Contribute to soccer culture at large um, in any way you can. Grassroots, you know, high school kids playing soccer, whatever you have, access whatever to. you have access to. That's the best way to do it. And then from there, you build a portfolio and then you can you can continue to move forward. I love that answer. Uh, what inspires your work? So I'm going to ask that as well. That's a really good question. I've said this before and I'll say it again. It's internal competition. I look at other people's work and I'm like, that's pretty cool. But the biggest thing is I'm always like, how do I get better from what I have done recently? Mm-hmm. That's it. That's the only thing that inspires me now is just, just, just being better, making, making good images and, and trying to find how to make better images. That's awesome. I think internal competition, like it's, it's, it's one thing to look on social media and, get imposter syndrome and being like, Oh, like oh, I'm, man. I'm not, time. I'm not, I'm not better. Like, you know, you'll see Mark Blinch's photos and you're like, fuck, what am I doing with it? Yes. All you the time. I mean? like, I, I, like, I'll see, I'll see, I'll see what you and I, Thomas post. I'm like, Oh my God. I'll see what Thomas posts and I'll be like, Holy shit. Like, this I guy is so much better than me. But I'll see it, what Kevin posts. And it's I the think, same thing. I think you said something there. It's the way, the, the way you look at it, the yeah. you can look at it and be like, fuck, I'm not as good as these guys. Yeah. But you also got to realize like someone like Mark or, or, or Kevin have ye- decades of experience. Yeah. Right. And, but, and I think you can use it as motivation versus using it as a way of like, I'm not good enough. You, you got to use it as a, I know I can get to that point. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's also like, there's no point in trying to compete with somebody that's, you know, especially if you're starting out, there's no point in trying to compete with somebody that has access to, for example, like hundreds of thousands of dollars of gear, right? So like teams will provide their photographers with gear. 
a lot in a lot of cases, right? So it's very difficult to compete with people that have that those sorts of resources. So. And also, it's like if you're still shooting like college or high yes. school, don't compare yourself to someone who's shooting NBA or NHL because the subject matter is completely different. It is. It is. And and like, you know, it's a simple thing like videography and photography at its core is the capture of light. And mm-hmm. something as simple as a college arena or a high school arena compared to an NBA arena, the lighting is vastly different. Even, even like going back to Miami's dog shit stadium, <laughs> their light is half as bright as like the next closest MLS stadium. So shooting at night there is horrible. It's really bad. You have to crank your eyes or don't... drag your shutter because it's just, it's just poorly lit. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't realize like, you know, you, you can shoot, there's, you could shoot an NBA player in an incredibly shitty lit gym. And then you could shoot a high school team in Scotiabank arena. And one is going to look way better than the other purely based off of the lighting itself. Yeah. Like, it's insane. It has nothing to do with the subject matter at that point. It's, it's all like, about the lighting. It's all about the lighting, how you frame the subject and everything like that. Yeah. yeah. So that sort of, yeah. Internalize your competition. Just try to be better than you were when you started the day. I love that. Yeah. Last question. What do you do about outside of sports photography to keep busy? Everything. Sports is a small portion. Okay. It, it is and it isn't a small portion, right? Like, um, there are some, like, especially during COVID, like I had to pivot. I did a lot of, a lot of work with restaurants, a lot of work with, um, like corporate clients, headshots, yeah. weddings, tons and tons and tons of what I literally cannot count the amount of weddings I shot during COVID. COVID weddings were also awesome. Anyone who's shot a wedding during COVID, I'm super sure intimate, look, intimate, fun, super easy, no stress. Just like people just want to get married, man. Like, yeah. inside, like I just want to get married to my partner. Yeah. Man. It's so lovely. Like people really like truly that just want to be together and they have only their close friends and close family. It really fun to be a part of. That's um, nice. yeah. Like just anything and everything. I, I, I work, if you're in the Toronto region, like I work for the region of Peel. So like Mississauga, Brampton, Caledon, and I take pictures of, of like public infrastructure projects. That's, that's wild. Uh, Man of many with, talents. Yeah. Just that kind of stuff. Like, um, you know, anything and everything I can get my hands on. And, and people are always like, Oh, like even at regional Peel, they're like, Oh, this must be so boring for you. I'm like, it's not boring. Like I love having a camera and lens in my hand. Like, and this is, a pa- this is the main passion behind what we do. It yeah. does not have to be sports. It can be, it can be, I like, I love, doing weddings i love taking my camera going to the beach with some friends and capturing yes. that like it's it's the pure art form yes of it, right like, yes exactly right and like we've said it a thousand times yeah. it's just like all of those things inform your image making later on and you can apply it back to, to your sports. main career exactly yeah. um to wrap up here what is an ask everyone what's the number one piece of advice for someone who's new who wants to get into this obviously we have gone through so many topics but if you had to sum up your biggest piece of advice for you know someone who's in high school or college who wants to get Mm. to where you are one day what's the biggest piece of advice or what's the biggest piece of advice you would have given a younger version of you there's two things Uh, there's a high risk version and a low risk version the high risk version is don't have a plan b okay and that mean that doesn't mean because that puts you, you that if I don't if you don't mind me saying it's because you only you will do whatever it takes to accomplish plan A. Yes, that's right. Survival at no cost. Yes, that's that's literally it. it's like you you commit to it, but like fully commit to it. Don't don't half ass it, right? There's, it's not a half measure. There's no it's, safety net. It's like this this is it, and you have to be you have to have that. And it's not like a, I want to do it. It's the understanding that I will do this, mm-hmm. right? No matter what it is, I will do this. And for me, that wasn't I'm going to work in sports. My I will do this was I will become a successful photographer. I will do this. I have what it takes. Manifesting and, and, it. And, I, and if I don't have it right now, I can learn it. And believe in, believe in your ability to learn things. Believe in your ability to get better. Believe in your ability to, to take criticism mm-hmm. and, and apply it and and you know, push yourself into a, into a position where you are, you know, at, at a point where, where you can say you're successful and, I, and it's success. That's a whole other success thing. is so like based on like the person and like, the, yeah. yeah. So I, I, what's the low risk? The low risk is just believe in yourself. Right. And that doesn't necessarily, you know, the low risk is if you want to, if you want to become a, a, you know, freelance photographer or, or full-time photographer in an industry as competitive as sports understand that it is, it is very competitive and it's very, very difficult. Um, and you constantly, you constantly have to grow and improve. Mm -hmm. Otherwise someone will pass you. And that is a scary kind of thought. 
but it kind of lights a fire under it your does ass. like i i always tell people it's like you gotta realize like if you sit on your laurels and don't keep pushing yourself like someone's gonna want to take your job exactly and and it's important to, to just continue to push yourself to continue to learn right and, and it they're both similar but i think it's understanding that if you are going to do the plan a plan b thing like make sure make sure that you you're you're ready to take on the challenge because mm-hmm. i think i think if you don't have that that belief of like i'm going to i am going to do this and this is this like doing this is for me then it's going to be really difficult to, yeah. to be successful and that might come off as a little bit harsh or a little bit but daunting. it's a reality I think it is a reality. And Sometimes you got to say say it how it is. Yeah, and I, I don't know if that's a fair reality, but it's you got to you really have to be and that's why I think the the high risk version is kind of the way you have to do it. it yeah. It, it's you really have to say okay, this is it. I'm I'm committing. To I have this. no nothing to fall back on. I'm jumping off the plane and yeah. seeing where it takes me. Yeah. And so for me that wasn't I'm doing this in sports. It was more I'm, I'm going to no, be a photographer. I'm going to be a photographer and I'm going to do anything and everything it takes to be a photographer. So that was I got a. I originally got a job. Uh, my first salary job out of school was working in house at a at a fashion importer exporter fashion. So I was taking pictures of, of t shirts, sweaters, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on a mannequin. Wow! Hundreds of pieces of clothing now, every day. And now you're shooting professional athletes. Yes. That, like that's just the way. But like you you took that step to uh, like take that plan A and make it work. Like I'm going to be a photographer starting here. Yep. And now you're here, and you know who knows where you're going to end up in in five years, right? Yeah. Like, you know, it, it could be anything, but I love that. I really think that's one of the best pieces of advice I've heard on the podcast so far. Someone saying like, don't have a plan B, go for plan A at all costs. I love that. I love Sweet. That. Well, I'm glad, glad, to, um, happy to be on the pod. Yeah, no, I appreciate you coming <laughs> on to wrap up. Where are you, what, what's next for you over the next few months here? Where are we going to, where are we going to see your work coming Ooh. out of? Obviously MLS is wrapping up, NHL's kicking off. Yeah. What are the next few months looking like for you? Got a lot of leaf stuff on the docket mm-hmm. here. Hoping, hoping uh, there's going to be some stuff with the Raptors this year. Knock on, uh, wood. that's not wood. No, but. it is wood. It's just painted. It's, uh, it's, it's okay, wood. it's wood. It's wood. So, so I'm, yeah, I'm hoping there's going to be a little bit more, a little bit more stuff with the Raptors this year that uh, may or may not be in the works. Awesome. Um, awesome. Uh, I got some stuff with the Raptors 905 coming up. Cool. So yeah, that's on the sports side, Keep and then. You know, weddings here and there. Yeah. Just uh, life. Just life in general, right? And and again, like being flexible and open to whatever Other, comes. new opportunities, whatever yeah. comes your way. Yeah, for sure. That's the beauty of, of photography and videography is there. One hundred percent. Go anywhere and anywhere. You can go anywhere and everywhere with it. Yeah. Where can the uh, people find you on on social media? What's where's what's your Instagram? What's your you know Twitter, TikTok, whatever you have? Like, hit, hit us with it. Everything is at Shashang, which is my I last name. Good put, luck with that. I'm gonna put it in big letters here, and if you're listening to this. Just go on to the description and you'll find his handle. Yeah. Um, thank you, dude, so much for coming on the podcast, giving your insight. I appreciate you making the time. We've been planning this for a while now because I was trying to go through our conversation and try to figure <laughs> out when we first brought it up. I swear it's, it's been more than a year. Yeah, it's been no, more than a year. Finally did it. Thank you so much, dude. And dude. for you guys listening, thank you guys. And I hope you guys learned something from this I guy. Hope so too. He's a wealth of experience. Feel free to feel free. Make sure you follow him on Instagram, socials, whatever, whatever he ends up giving me to give you guys to follow, give him a follow. I really appreciate you making the time, man. Uh, thanks for having me. And yeah, again, like if you have any questions, anything, please reach out, DM me. I don't have that many followers. So I'll, <laughs> I'll see your message. I will see it. And yeah, if there's anything I can help you with, any advice, any, any questions, any, you know, comments, questions, concerns, just reach out and I'll do my best to help. Cause I love that. Know, at the end of the day, like, you know, th- there's an important piece about legacy, I think, that I'll, I personally carry with me, which is making sure that the next generation of people coming up behind or, or you know, that are that are growing with us, they're they're in a better spot than I was when mm-hmm. I was, you know, at a certain point. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate at all. I'd love to help. It's, uh, you know, that's why we're here. That does it for episode 10 of the Sports Creative Showcase. Thank you, Lucas, for coming on. I'll catch you guys next time. Peace.